The Sesh Podcast, episode 130, take one. Hi, friends, and welcome back to The Sesh. I am Kendall Ray. And I'm Janelle, and we are joined by our lovely producers, Corelli and Sydney. Welcome back for another fun-filled episode. This yes. actually is going to be a very fun episode. Yeah, we have a special guest joining us today. We haven't had a guest on The Sesh since yes, Mr. Hiram. Sesh. It's yes, been a minute. Sesh. Yeah. We also have a guest next week. We do. Marlene Estelle will be coming on the show. Mm-hmm. We're very excited for that. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Um, But today we have someone that you guys probably don't know. My doula, Carly. (laughs) Probably don't know. (laughs) She is amazing. You should know her. And um, in honor of Mother's Day, we thought it would be fun to bring Carly on to talk about her experiences. I mean, she has some stories. She's been at many births. She was at my birth. And she will kind of answer some questions that you guys sent in about birth in general and about what it's like being a doula and yeah. she's a really interesting amazing person i think she i always tell her she's an angel um i will never give birth without carly and if you're in the colorado area you can hit up carly to be at your birth hell yeah so how cool is that so she's going to be here um in a little bit and we will do an interview with her but we are going to start out here with a spicy topic and a csi and a csi that's a little right. bit of both that's right always keeping it fun and fresh here that's right god you all right there you sound like you're choking <laughs> i am not doing well kendall mm-hmm. has a cold i don't something. even know if it's a cold i like somewhat think it's like allergies like nasal drip you know i don't know that's, it's just mm, that's but, what i've been feeling too is like i don't necessarily feel sick but yeah. something's been happening in my sinuses right like yeah. it's just I don't feel sick. I don't feel any symptoms of being sick. No. Uh, yeah. No. Nice I worked out just fine yesterday, but it, it was like harder to breathe because I'm, I don't know. My throat just is sore and I feel like I'm not getting enough airflow. I but we had to take some deep breaths. Yeah. And I, I think it's maybe I got it from Holly or she got it from me because she's she's sick once again. Oh, oh no. poor thing. Not too bad this time, though. Like she's feel she, she feels, feels fine. That's good. She's eating great. God, she ate a lot last night. I made her a bagel with peanut butter and cream cheese, but like cut it all really small mm. and um, some pickles. The girl is a pickle. That's our girl. Yeah, she's a pickle girl. One hundred percent. I'm so proud of her. <laughs> she likes to have pickles with pretty much all her meals now, which she doesn't get them every single time. But mm. she like so if I can't good. get her to eat anything, she will have really? some cut up pickles. Dude, she lives for the pickles. Oh my god, I'm so like happy. When she refuses everything Thank else, god. pickles. Pickles are there. Yes, I know. Uh, I know. I'm really proud of her. Um, but it's great because she's she's eating just fine, napping just fine, sleeping just fine. But she's just got the the same like kind of cold, raspy voice as me. And so we've been keeping an eye, doing some steam showers. Uh, we laid pretty low this weekend, so that you know. She wasn't exposed to too much. I tried to, I figured, you know, it's really hard as a parent trying to navigate things. Cause there's, there's like a billion different opinions and stuff online. Like I'm, I'm like, I always heard when you're sick, it's good to go outside and get some fresh air, be outdoors. But of course I'm reading online, like it could make allergies worse. This, you know, they could get, pick up other things and yeah, but mm-hmm. I finally made the the call yesterday. Like I, I think she needs some fresh air. So I got her outside for like an hour. I think she was feeling good after, but there's so many where I'm like, you can't just keep your kid from getting sick. Well, no, all the time, you know, like you still got to live life. Like what if we had other kids and they have a soccer game or. Yeah. I mean, I think it's good to get outside. Yeah, I would assume so. I guess the allergies. Vitamin D is bad, but I don't know. I feel like the outdoors are generally pretty good for you. (laughs) I know it's just it was hard because I don't know if it's the allergies that are making me sick. Is that what's making her sick? But then, like being in our house, well, allergies you might are as contagious. Well be outside. So if you're getting it, it's not guaranteed that she's gonna get right. it. Right. Right. I don't know. Her immune and system. And like I said, being in our house is like plenty of allergens in there. Yeah. So and her her immune system is building up. So I'm sure like these little colds are gonna you know she's gonna yeah. have them and she's gonna become more resistant. That's how you build your immune system, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm just. I think I'm a little traumatized after last time when totally. she, you know it was just a cold and then it mm-hmm. ended up being so much worse really fast. Yeah. yeah. That I'm just like on edge. Yeah. That makes sense. Worried it's gonna, you know, like ugh, sucking her nose out as much as I can. <laughs> we got like an so at the hospital they have like a nose sucker that's a machine that yeah. pulls it out versus the nose freighter that you suck yourself. 
And so after we went to the hospital, we ended up getting one of those, not the hospital grade one, but they have like cheaper versions. Yeah. Yeah. Thing is amazing. Really? Parents out there worth every penny. She hates it though. If she even hears it turns on, she starts Aww. screaming. Aww. It's so sad. Poor girl. I is know. it quick though? It probably feels so it, better it is. after. Oh though. yeah. I think she feels way better after. Yeah. It really gets, it gets a lot. You like load oh, her up yeah. with saline or you can do saline in one side and suck the other. Yep. It's kind of like a neti pot effect. Yeah. Oh. It's good. It's good. It's have, good. Have you tried it on yourself? Have you tried sucking out your own boogers? No, Josh wanted to. And I told <laughs> him that is disgusting. <laughs> why? Yeah, why? I guess you could clean it. Huh. Well, I'm assuming you clean it after you use it on her it's anyways. It's like a tiny nostril, though. I don't even... He'd have to like shove it way up there to get it... Or like push around to get a suction. I don't know. I would want to try it. Could be fun. I want the booger sucked out of me. Mm, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah. So we had a very chill weekend. Um, Lovely. Just, relaxing i had a lot of good naps this weekend i pretty much napped every time she did and it was nice really oh yeah how often does she nap um she's doing two naps a day right now so she goes down two to three hours after she wakes up so i literally was so tired saturday morning that i was just like waiting until like as soon as it was the two hour mark i'm like you want to go to nap ah. you want to go lay down and as soon as she did i went back to sleep at like 10 for another hour and a half it was so nice Mm. I love sleep. Me too. I love sleep. Me too. You know what I realized? Part of it is, and I bet this is true for you too, it's like the only time I don't feel anxiety. Um, kind <laughs> of. I'm asleep. But I have bad dreams, so. Oh, that sucks. Kind of though. I have bad dreams too, but I kind of like them. They're interesting. Oh, I just have like bad dreams. Like just bad things happening. Yeah, okay. All the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't have good dreams. And, see, and I'm not being sarcastic. Like I literally don't have good dreams. That's ever. so sad. I ever. hate that for you. This is and fine. You, I'm used to it. You weren't the type that when you have a bad dream that you can, you know that you're dreaming. No, I wake up and I'm like, for a few seconds, I think it actually happened. Then I remember and I'm like, oh, wow. thank God. That, I've only experienced that like once or twice in my you whole life. You know you're dreaming when you're dreaming? Yeah. Hell no. I always know my that it's not know. real. No, I think it's totally real. And then I wake up and I still am like, wait, where am I? What's going on? I'm like, oh, I was sleeping. Okay. Mm. But I don't dream that oft as often as. Well, at least I don't remember them very often, but I love sleeping more than anything in the world. I fucking love it. You know, what's really interesting. I was reading that when you're, I don't even know if this is true, so don't like fact check me on this, but when you're dreaming, you're not in a full deep sleep. Like when you're in yeah. a deep sleep, you're dreaming still, but you don't remember those dreams or something like that. So when you're dream dreaming, you're in a lighter sleep. Mm -hmm. So that's why if I you smoke weed, true. it's easier to, to get into a deeper sleep. And so that's probably why you don't dream as much when you smoke before you go to bed interesting yeah well, don't fact check my science on weed, that i could be wrong weed kills your i don't think it ha i don't think it makes you go into a deeper sleep in fact i think there's studies out there that weed disrupts your deep sleep um uh, interesting and that you're in REM sleep most of the time because REM sleep is not deep sleep but REM sleep is where you dream no so, i think REM sleep is where <clears throat> you're like well, I think like you're your always dreaming, but if you remember them, I think you have to be in the lightest form of sleep to actually recall the dreams. But REM is the but, heaviest yeah. form of sleep. No, yeah. I don't think so. I thought REM was the heaviest sleep. Um, that's when your eye, rapid eye movement, that's what that stands for, right? When you're in a deep sleep, I, you get into REM. The REM cycle is like the deepest form of sleep, I thought. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's what I always thought. N1, N2, N3, and then REM. Vivid dreaming. See, you're because there's four stages of sleep. Your it's, brain waves in REM sleep are closer to wakefulness than deep sleep. Interesting. But REM is where your body um, repairs itself. Like that's. But when, you can only only recall the dreams if because you're dreaming throughout the whole cycle. Your mind yeah. is never not doing anything. It's just right. whether or not you can recall them, right? Yeah, I mean, people have dreams. I believe every single I'm night. I'm sure you guys will tell have, us in the comments. What's so? How does weed factor into all this? Have you guys um? Do you guys vivid dream or like lucid dream? Are you able to? What I've never like full lucid is where you're like aware <laughs> fully like, yeah. in, in a touch way you with can, your consciousness. In, in a way you can even like control your dreams in a way like, you yeah. know, you know what's going on in the dream. I think to some degree I do, but not like full on where I can control what's going to happen next. But I have this awareness that I'm dreaming. So remember, I don't know if I remember last a few weeks ago, um, I was talking about the cheese thing, like the cheddar cheese. A lot of people eat shit ton of cheese before bedtime because it helps you get to that like lucid stage of sleeping Isn't it something easier. like the, the case and that's in it or something or? it's the it's some, oh i know that for milk like it's some, you're not supposed to drink milk before you go to bed. or like chocolate or you're supposed people to say chocolate drink milk before you go to bed because it helps you sleep or milk 
Or, no, I think it gives you dreams. <laughs> Don't take sleep dreams. advice from uh, us. Okay, I just looked no it up. It says deep about. sleep is often confused with REM sleep, but there are differences between the two. This third stage of sleep is non-rapid eye movement, which is REM. Your body can enter this stage about half an hour to 45 minutes after falling asleep. Unlike REM, deep sleep is associated with a change in the body rather than the brain. Your breathing mm. is slowed down. And your heartbeat is regular. Your muscles are relaxed, blah, blah. This form of sleep is very important as the body gets, heals itself during this period. Mm. Hmm. So I There are no up. dreams during this sleep. You feel disoriented when you wake up from this sleep. Deep sleep can last about one to two hours, which is a quarter of your sleep time. Hmm. So yeah, REM and deep are different. Okay, so I got that mix. Interesting. I need to take like a whole class about sleep. It's such an interesting... The fact that we spend so much time asleep, mm. you should probably know more about what the fuck's going Isn't on like during that. Isn't it like a quarter of your life that you spent sleeping? It's got to be more than that. Think about it. You're sleeping, I mean, recommended eight hours is a like day. eight hours a day. Uh, yeah. I love sleeping so much. I wish I could sleep 12 hours a day. That would be ideal for me. Half awake, half asleep. I love dreaming. Lately, I've been having, I can't really recall them. Like, I can't think of any right now. But lately, I've been having a lot of dreams in general. Mm. Um, like this weekend, I had a couple of dreams, like back to back. One of them was work related. I can't remember what it was, but it was very real. Like I honestly kind of thought I got in trouble, and then <laughs> that was real. Oh. You're in trouble. Fuck. All right, guys, it was great <laughs> knowing you. No, get um, off. Just kidding. We love Girlie <laughs> so much. She's the best. <laughs> the other one was um, I was in Mexico with my parents or something, with my dad or something, and my aunt and my cousin were fighting with me. I don't know. Something happened. It was so vivid. I like, I woke up and I was like, I was like, wait, did I talk to them on the phone or something? Like I didn't, it was just a dream. Dreaming. Yeah. You spent about a, one third of your life either sleeping or attempting to do so. Actually, it's kind of funny when I was sleeping on Saturday, Josh had the H3 podcast on and I was sleeping during it. And I think they like their voices got into my dream. And I, I had this weird dream that they were like filming a porno. But they all had like <laughs> fake wieners because it was on YouTube. So they had to have fake. This is probably Bro, really weird to say. Fuck? I, I woke up and I was like, you Josh, were they Ethan's like talking? fake wiener? What? No, it wasn't Ethan. It was like the rest of the crew. What? It was like Dan and and <laughs> Ian. She it was really wiener. weird. I wonder if they were talking about something. I mean, who knows? They they go all they over talk, the place. Yeah, so. I mean, it wouldn't H3. shock me. Speaking of oh, H3, yeah. you guys. Uh, they mentioned we were us on, on the it. show. That was cool. They even cool played a spot. clip. It was our girl Olivia. We love her. I don't know about Kendall. I fully fangirled. I have no problem oh, admitting I that. Fully, fully fangirled. Um, I was yeah. really excited. Like, can't it believe it cool. actually happened. Yeah, it, it was the was second really cool. time in in the last month that Ethan's mentioned my name on. He's the acknowledged show. you like, twice at least. Yeah, kind of crazy. I've been watching um since the vape day, vape, vape nation days. days vape nation, sure. bro. Vape nation. Yeah, I love uh that show. I love their crew. Um. We love Olivia. We Zach. Do. All Ian, of them. All, all of seriously, them. I love Dan. I ordered some of that new Teddy Fresh collection. Oh, yeah. I, I saw cannot that. wait. I'm so excited. I'm obsessed with everything Ela makes. Oh, I'm Ela's a Ela. fucking icon. She's such a badass. She cool is. Bitch. Like, I love her so, so much. Cool. Yeah, so, she's awesome. Yeah. Well, we're kind of running out of time here, but I wanted you. You uh, just told me you. Oh, yeah. Okay. You almost punched some dude? No, not really. I just like got really annoyed with this rando. Um, so me and my friend went to see <laughs> the Giggly Squad, which is a podcast um, hosted by Hannah Burner and Paige DeSorbo. Anyways, we're fans. I'm a really big fan of Hannah specifically. Um, but anyways, they had they were they're on tour right now, so we went and saw them, and then we went to this bar after, and these losers were trying to talk <laughs> to us, and he was like saying some stupid joke that wasn't funny, and my friend straight up was like, "Sorry, your joke's not funny." <laughs> what? So she was like, she was like, "Sorry, your joke," like. She was like, you're, I don't know, you you missed the punchline. She's like, sorry, it's not very funny. And then he like got butthurt about it and started like dissing us. And some somehow he, we, we were like, yeah, we were at a comedy. We went to a comedy show or whatever. And, um, you know, this is our one big night out. We were making a joke. Like we don't go out often. And she was like, yeah, I put on real clothes and makeup for this. And he was like, oh, we can, I can tell you guys are wearing makeup. I'm like, this is a good one. <laughs> so anyways, like afterwards, we we're like, whatever. We like blew him off and walked away and went and sat down on our own. And we're just sitting there. And then these other two dudes started talking to us. And we're just like making conversation about random shit. And then, um, we weren't talking to him at all, but he kept like saying weird stuff to us and trying to like call us ugly and stuff. And I was what? like, if I'm so, if we're so ugly, why are you keep talking to us? Then you fucking loser what ass. What a waste of his time. And he was ugly, by the way. <laughs> and me and my friend are record. really cute. And we are not ugly. He's ugly. <laughs> and then we were talking about how she just bought a house recently, like a year ago. And then I just bought a house. And so we were talking about that. And then 
literally out of, I'm like, what are you eavesdropping? Cause we're like a good eight <laughs> feet away. He looks and he's like, Oh, you guys bought a house or did your husbands buy the house for you? Bitch. And I was like, on. fuck off, dude. Anyways. Um, yeah, I hate random men like that. Like shut the fuck up. It's so annoying. God, no, that's all I have to say about that. Like, I would have lost my go shit. away. Did you say anything after that? I was like, no. Well, I was like, we bought these houses. And I was like, you're a fucking loser. And then I asked him, I was like, do you go to DU? Because he looks like old, kind of. Like mm. older than me and I'm not in college. And he was like, yeah, I did. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, did you graduate from there or whatever? Because the bar we went to was right by DU, which is a college. And this is all after he's called you ugly? No, this was like before he called us oh, ugly. Okay. And I was like, I was like, why are you entertaining this fuck? Yeah, this was before. And then... Yeah, he was like, you guys are not going to get... He's like, are you waiting for drinks? And we we're like, yeah. And he's like, well, you're not going to get anyone to come over to you. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so we like walked over. Ew, and uh, but he kept like saying... We were talking and he kept saying weird things across the bar. And I couldn't even really hear what he was saying. And then he would like look at us and my friend would like say something snobby back to him. And then he would just like start laughing and hit his little vape. I was like, dude, you suck. <laughs> It's like such a fucking It reminds loser. me of like third grade boy vibes. No, like it was total third grade boy vibes. Flirting by being a bully. I was like, yeah, can you fuck right off? It was weird. So mm. anyways, that was my weekend though. What a who is her? I am so excited about today's sponsor, Hatch. Now I have been using Hatch since my daughter was born. And oh my gosh, we are obsessed with our Hatch sound machine. It has been the key to helping our daughter sleep better through the night. As a lot of you know, waking up feeling well rested and refreshed and also having children in the home don't always go hand in hand. But with Hatch Rest, restful nights for the entire family can be a new reality. Our daughter has been sleeping with the Hatch Rest since she was born. She absolutely cannot sleep without it. It has a huge variety of sounds to choose from and we use it pretty much all throughout the day. And now they have the new and improved second generation hatch rest that makes sleep even better and more magical for your entire family. The all-in-one hatch rest is a smart sleep device with a sound machine and a nightlight that grows with your kids. Babies love the continuous sounds of white noise and lullabies for a soothing and comfortable sleep environment. Toddlers and big kids build sleep independence with color and sound cues. The time for bed pairing alerts them that it's time to wind down for the night. And in the morning, the time to rise signal lets them know it's okay to get out of bed for the day, keeping those early risers in bed for longer. My daughter is so used to sleeping with her hatch sound machine. If we don't have it, she literally will not sleep. And I love it because having white noise on not only keeps your baby asleep, but keeps other noises from waking them up. And sometimes it's hard to be quiet in your house. You know, your kid goes to bed so early. Maybe you're doing laundry or, you know, some other type of chore vacuuming. And when you have white noise going, that risk of them waking up is a lot smaller. The rest has helped over 3 million babies and parents get restful sleep. No wonder it's consistently a top baby registry item. So right now, Hatch is offering our listeners up to 15% off your purchase of a Hatch Rest and free shipping at hatch.co slash sesh. So if you're ready for improved sleep for your kids and for yourself, Go to hatch.co slash sesh to get 15% off and free shipping. That's hatch.co slash sesh. Are we ready to get into okay, this Okay, let's topics? get into it. Um, uh, what you are we know, starting off with? Speaking of Le Who Is hers, <laughs> we have Chris Brown. This motherfucker is still... He's still around? I know. I just thought he was completely done after he... I mean, nearly killed Rihanna. It was so fucking brutal. No, he has hella fans still. Yeah, it, which shocks me. People still love his music. He's still featured in shit. And uh, I hate it. I hate society. But um, yeah, he he's really popping off again on May 5th. He got a little, he got into a spat. Yeah, for Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. Usher and Chris Brown got into a big argument in Vegas. It wasn't really a big argument at all though like there's no footage of it or anything well big enough <laughs> big i mean enough to throw hands i'd say that's a big enough argument oh well allegedly there's no like actual confirmation that he threw mm. hands or anything but i, I guess i uh, sure okay so basically what happened is they're at this rolling roller skate rink in vegas and they were celebrating chris's 34th birthday which apparently usher threw for him i don't know but anyways um at one point so there is footage of Chris Brown. He's trying to talk to this singer, Tayana or Tiana Taylor. 
I actually don't know her music. I listened to oh, some of it last night. She's incredible. Yeah, I, was saying, I, I love her. Bomb. I love her so much. Yeah, voice. She's also a model and she does a bunch of other things, but amazing. Gorgeous girl. Well, anyways, she basically refused to talk to Chris. You can kind of see in this video, she's like kind of blowing up, blowing him off, it seems like. And apparently this pissed him off and he started kind of yelling. And then like the video cuts. Um, we can actually just like watch the little clip here. So there, there, yeah, she's right there and she's kind of like not really giving him the time of day. And then he starts, you know, yelling over Usher's shoulder and then he skates off into the abyss. But anyways, Usher like tries to intervene and then he like kind of goes after him once he runs off. And so they leave the skate rink and then they go out into the parking lot and the two of them are behind some like charter buses and they were there for a few minutes and then Usher came out with a bloody nose, they said. Ooh. So that, you know, makes people think that they like gone to an altercation and maybe he punched Usher in the nose or whatnot. But apparently what, see the thing that's weird is the next day, because they're all there to also um, perform at Lovers and Friends. It's a music festival. And um, the next day, both of them seem like they're totally fine. They're performing at this festival. And Usher even posted like a handful of videos on his story showing like his setup and stuff. And his face looks completely fine. Like he doesn't look like he's a broken nose or he's like cut or anything like that. So I don't know if they actually got into an altercation. But what's funny well kind of more like crazy and pathetic on <laughs> chris brown's part is right after this the next day there's another video released of him yelling at someone during a missy elliott set on that night and he's like screaming at this person we can go ahead and play this video this is me i'm like dude you need to fucking control yourself Wait, this let's is ridiculous. do this so here he is you can hear him like kind of yelling at something right now. Like, dude, control yourself. This guy's out of his. He's too old for this shit. Thirty four. What are you doing? I'm trying to fight. <laughs> you are too grown. So that was literally like less than twenty four hours, or maybe God, just I can't after twenty four hours. Stand him. I can't stand that he's still around. We have to look at his face and hear about him. Ugh. Yeah. Well, he can't control his emotions. Yeah. Clearly, getting into little spats. In one weekend, two in one weekend. Like, calm down. If he really hit Usher, take a chill pill. Mm mm mm. Usher's so hot. I l fucking love Usher. He's so hot, dude. When we were talking about the fact that we were going to cover this last night, it was just in my head as I was falling asleep. That one song that's like, "If you dance on a pole, that don't make you a hoe." Your Johnny song. Mine. <laughs> when you twerk in the splits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go get your money, 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 money get your money, money, money. money. <sighs> I love Usher. God, he's, he's so, so talented. talented and he's so hot. Mm -hmm. But him and Chris are friends and I think they're fine. I don't know. They seem to be fine afterwards. Usher's face was fine. So, Remember when Usher really? was mean to T Pain though? No. Yeah. He I like told him he ruined music. I love T Pain. Yeah. T Pain's above all of them for me. Really? Oh, same. I love T Pain. I love T Pain too. Honestly. He's, a, he's a good man. He's a great singer. He actually he's, is. He's, he's, people don't know that. He he's is. so good. Whatever happened him, to T? I don't. I don't know. I think he's still around. He's like in the no, music he industry. Just made, who T Pain? Yeah. He, I think he just released a new album. Actually, like Ooh, last a couple is he still weeks auto tuning ago. Or uh, no, this one. <laughs> this one was more of like a like an actual like him Ooh. singing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. No, dude. I heard him sing when I was in uh, high school. I went to summer jam and he like broke out ah. the piano and started doing like and slow jams. Like, oh shit! And I was like, shit, guy can sing. But yeah, he uh, Usher apparently told him that he ruined music. I remember that. Yeah, no, his album came out. Um, I think we talked about it on the show a few years ago. Fucking rude. Why would you? Oh, say it was that fucking to him? rude. I know, Usher. Usher baby. Usher baby. <laughs> so, I still yeah, love Usher. I feel like I they're all kind of rude. Except for I hate Chris Brown. He's a fucking yeah, loser. Yeah, he can go off the planet to Mars. I don't even think he's talented. Sorry. Really? Oh, no. I, I agree with I that. Think, I mean, his, uh, his one his song forever. I was like, and dance forever. <laughs> but the <laughs> thing in the background, that <laughs> if I even hear that song, that's all I can hear now. It drives me fucking nuts. And there's, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> Listen to that song. There's like this little like <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's so fucking annoying, but I do love that song. Remember, he got dropped. He was sponsored by like Double Mint Gum. Yeah, and they dropped him because of that yeah. whole thing. 
it was like double your pleasure. So they would just double be like, double your pleasure. pleasure. Double your And then fun. it would just be silent on the radio. And be like, there's mm, forever, mm, mm. ever, forever, ever. <laughs> yeah, dude. He's, I honestly do think he is talented, but I, his douchebaggery eh. ruins any talent that he has. He was a good dancer. Yeah. Especially yeah. at his age. Really good voice. I was looking at Chris Brown's discography. And honestly, he has... A lot of big bangers, but you heard it here first. Also, also, fuck him, <laughs> fuck him. Yeah, that's the thing. Is like big bangers. No one cares if you're talented if you are just an asshole. That's incorrect. A lot of people care. Yeah, that's that's what's <laughs> fucked about society. I was like, I'm wrong. Makes me really sad that he's still people love his. He age. Still makes plenty of dough, and yeah. he's still around. And Sometimes it's really hard, to, like, to separate the art from the artist, but. Sometimes I I'm feel saying like sometimes we shouldn't. Though. We shouldn't. No, it you know? shouldn't be like that, but. That's like a, a whole other can of worms to get into. Oh, no, no, yeah, so it is. Like, yeah. yeah. I don't even know. Well, speaking of artists, artists Ed. let's get into our CSI. So back in 2017, Ed was sued by the family of Ed Townsend. Uh, they claim that the song Thinking Out Loud and I'm the song... Thinking Out Loud Really We Found Love Right. Loud. Where, Where we, we yep, are. Yep, that one. Um, that is the one, right? Am yeah. I stupid? Okay. Yeah, thinking it loud. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, we'll be yeah, the, yeah. in love when there's we're seventy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That whole song. Mm. Beautiful song. I yeah. love that song. That's like the one Ed Sheeran song I really like. Is it right, Ed Sheeran or Ed Sheeran? <laughs> it's like Sheeran Ed rap. Sheeran. <laughs> Ed Sheeran <laughs> rap. Sheeran, right? Ed Sheeran rap. Sheeran. I used to think Sheeran. 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 Ed, Ed Sheeran. She ran away. Yeah, we were just talking about. We're not a that big of fans of Sorry. Ed's music. But I do love Ed. He's a lovely chap. Yeah, he seems like a nice guy. I he mean, I'm not in like that a movie. fan, but... You like that movie? Huh? <laughs> the one that we watched, I forced you to watch it with me. We had sushi in bed and we watched it. The Beatles movie. Oh, yeah. He was in that. He I was, forgot he, he was, was in that. He's a pretty funny lad, right? I like him. Uh, I like Good his, actor. his accent. Not don't like his music. No, I don't. I really find his music like extremely annoying oh, other than that thing. She hates out Ed. Song. Kendall hates it. Like the shape of you song is like I'm in love with the shape. That plays in hell. I'm you sure of it. <laughs> I hate that. You push song a pole like so a magnet. Well, you know, you know what song? He's so much more talented than that. I feel like he like really got into the God, my throat is rough. The like pop stuff. I don't know. Remember the eighteen like, sold out. Slow lips, raining rain, the cobwebs. I don't know what it goes. <laughs> what? I forgot how it goes. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Like, lips. Lips. Uh, yeah. 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 Anyway, I I don't know. I don't think he's that good, but he's he's very very talented and extremely famous. Um, he is actually one of the top selling artists in the world. Oh yeah, he's got hella fame and money. Yeah, worth a lot of money. Yes. So he was basically accused of stealing um the song "Let's Get It On" mm -hmm. from Marvin Gaye, famous famous fucking song. Mm -hmm. We all know that song, and. They claim that it was very similar to Thinking Out Loud, mm -hmm. the one that we sang earlier and totally botched. Thinking out loud. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, you're welcome. <laughs> Ed Townsend co-wrote that song with Marvin Gaye. Yeah. And um, they claim that it had similarities that violated copyright. I feel like maybe you should cover this. My my throat's really going downhill from here. Okay, <clears> no <throat> worries. But yeah, Ed Townsend's family was like, yo, this song is extremely similar to the one that he and Marvin wrote. Now, in our so, opinions, what do we think about this? Mm, let's get it on. Thinking out loud. <laughs> and they do kind of sound, this because they were talking about this on the radio and they played the songs like mm -hmm. back to back. And I mean, I can, you can hear it, but I don't think it's that. But obvious. here's the thing, folks. Okay, here's the freaking thing. <laughs> Pop songs are basically all the same. Yeah. All the same. <laughs> in fact, Ed claims, quote, there's like four chords that get used in pop songs. And if you just think mathematically, the likelihood of this song having the same chords as this song, there's multiple, multiple songs. It's all having the same chords. Some of them are like ABC. You know, it's very yeah. similar. And we see lawsuits like this all the time. And Ed's basically made you know, he could have just settled and this wouldn't have been a big deal, but he wanted to fight it for the, you know, for the industry. Yeah. And for the principle of the thing, sure. you know, that it's better for other artists to have this protection because um, people will, you know, go after artists who are successful for pretty much anything. This happens all the time. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because this one clip, um, there's this 
uh, like comedy music group basically called Axis of Awesome, and they're from Australia. And they have this video where it's like this bit that they do, and they sing the same the like journey song don't stop believing they oh. have they like play that on the pan and yes. they sing like tons of different pop songs i've seen this and it all kind of goes together yeah so that was kind of they actually played that in the trial and was like okay you know this is just goes to show that a lot of the pop songs all sound very very similar well there's a whole conspiracy theory behind the music industry too that like people believe that it's all designed so that we'll like it and it like of course it's designed so that we'll like it no they <laughs> make it so we'll hate it no, no but people act like it is yes music is designed so that people will listen to it mm-hmm. um but anyway so that's kind of like the premise of why they were taking him to court and even though this happened back or that started happening back in 2017 it didn't end until now because of covid it kept getting delayed in forever and whatever but mm. the trial only lasted eight days and then the jury deliberated for a few hours and yeah i mean ed won the case um and this is the second time he's won a copyright case last year he won a case in england after it was alleged that he plagiarized his 2017 hit shape of you oh the devil the song of you. hate that you song so much like no don't even sing it i can't oh, stand. my heart has fallen too um but here's a video of him talking about that incident me, Johnny, and Steve have made a joint statement that will be press release on the outcome of this case. Ed. But I wanted to make a small video to talk about it like a bit Ed's because accent. I've not really been able to say anything whilst it's been going on. Whilst we're obviously happy with the result, I feel like claims like this are way too common now and have become a culture where a claim is made with the idea that a settlement will be cheaper than taking it to court, even if there's no base for the claim. It's really damaging to the songwriting industry. There's only so many notes and very few chords used in pop music. Coincidence is bound to happen if 60,000 songs are being released every day on Spotify. Just do the there's 22 million songs a year, and there's only 12 the notes that do are available. Mo- it's my thing. I don't want to take anything away from the thing. pain and hurt suffered from both sides of this case, but I just want to say I'm, I'm not an entity. I'm not a corporation. I'm a human being. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a son. Lawsuits are not a pleasant experience. And I hope with this ruling, it means in the future, baseless claims like this can be avoided. This really does have to end. Me, Johnny and Steve are very grateful for all the support Thank sent you, to us by fellow You get the songs. idea. So, yeah, that was from the Shape of You lawsuit. Um, here's a clip of him talking outside of court just recently this uh, from this, this recent one over uh, thinking out loud. Ed's looking happy there. He says I won the lawsuit. Uh, right. Uh, good morning, afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, being out here. I'm obviously very happy with the outcome of the case, and it looks like I'm not having to retire from my day job after all. But at the same time, I'm unbelievably frustrated that baseless claims like this are allowed to go to court at all. We've spent the last eight years talking about two songs with dramatically different lyrics, melodies, and four chords, which are also different and used by songwriters every day all over the world. These chords are common building blocks, which were used to create music long before Let's Get It On was written and will be used to make music long after we are all gone. They are in a songwriter's alphabet, our toolkit, and should be there for all of us to use. No one owns them, all the, the, all the way they are played, in the same way that nobody owns the color blue. Unfortunately, unfounded claims like this are being fueled by individuals who are offered as music experts in musical analysis. In this instant, the other side's musicologists left out words and notes, presented simple and different pitches as melody, and by doing so, created what I think we proved for all to see were misleading comparisons and disinformation to find supposed similarities where none exist. And I think we proved for all to see that they tried to manipulate my, my and Amy's song to try and convince the jury that they had a genuine claim. I'm very grateful that the jury saw through the, those attempts. This may seem this seems so dangerous to me. Both potential claimants who may be convinced to bring a bogus claim, as well as those songwriters facing them, it's simply wrong. By stopping this practice, we can also properly support genuine music copyright claims, so legitimate claims are rightly heard and resolved. If the jury had decided this matter the other way, we might as well say goodbye to the creative freedom of songwriters. We need to be able to write our original music and engage in independent creation without worrying at every step of the way that such creativity will be, will be wrongly called into question. Like artists everywhere, Amy and I work hard to independently create songs which are often based around real life personal experience. It's devastating to be accused of stealing someone else's song when we've put so much work into our livelihoods. 
I'm just a guy with a guitar who loves writing music for people to enjoy. I am not and will never allow myself to be a piggy bank for anyone to shake. Having to be in New York for this trial has meant that I've missed being with my family at my grandmother's (laughs) funeral in Ireland, and I will never get that time back. These trials take a significant toll on everyone involved, including Catherine. I want to thank the jury for making the decision that will help protect the creative process of songwriting. Thanks, Ed. We get the point. Um, Let's talk talk in uh, British accents the rest of the day. Actually, I think it's so fun to talk in a British accent. Me too. I'm pretty decent at it. I think you're pretty good. That sounded good. Thank you. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So I was born in Britain. Mm. If you guys didn't know, I was actually born in Great Britain. That Um, was that was very good. That's where (laughs) I'm getting Irish over here. (laughs) (laughs) So, as you heard him mention, he doesn't have to retire from music now. Um, he had made a statement that if this if they won this lawsuit, he would retire from at least writing songs. He clarified that. It would take all the joy out of writing songs. And if he were to continue with music, he would have someone else write songs for him because it would just, I, I can't imagine. Cause then you'd be like, is, does this sound like one of the millions of songs that's out there? Totally. Like the, the mental toll that would take. Yeah. Um, however, there is another side to the argument. Um, Ed Townsend, the family of Ed Townsend claims that there's a bigger issue here, that there is racial and cultural aspect to it. And here's a clip kind of explaining that in more detail. As the family of Ed Townsend, Marvin Gaye's co-writer on Let's Get It On, had alleged, and their attorney, Ben Crump, had pleaded with the jury to please give credit where credit is due. Beyond the copying of chord progressions or sheet music, this case to the family of Ed Townsend uh, had a, a, a racial and cultural aspect to it because they feel like... Uh, White musicians have misappropriated black music for generations, and here they thought they had an opportunity to right that wrong. But the jury did not agree and found Ed Sheeran not liable. Kira? Brian, what do you think about that, how race was brought into this? It made sense to me uh, from a historical standpoint. I know many people would argue that the music that made Elvis Presley was largely on the backs of those who are of color who made similar music and didn't get the the accolades. But I think that race didn't have much influence in this case. This was about chord progression. This was about music. Uh, I don't think that Ed Sheeran was sitting around somewhere thinking or even unconsciously attempting to take music from a different culture. He's singing pop music. This is music that, yes, has been largely popularized by different um, people of different backgrounds, but I, I don't see the race implications here while I do understand them from a historical context. Yeah, I definitely agree with him. I don't think it applies to this case, but there is a definitely a bigger topic there, um, which we've, I think, spoken on before. Um, definitely, it really goes back to Elvis Presley, who really fucked up everything. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that, because it's interesting, I took a um, history of music rock and roll class. Same. In college. I learned most of this. They, I mean, white people have basically stolen music and the idea of it. It was founded off of black people and sadly slavery. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. how songs and rock and roll specifically and blues, which was before rock and roll, turned into what music as we know today was because they were creating songs while doing hard labor. And it's really um, built on the the backs of black people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that needs to be recognized. Yes. I don't think this is a case of it, but Mm -hmm. I do understand that the point that they're trying to make of like, you know, having some recognition or more recognition, I should say. Yeah. um, Of the bigger issue. Which I think more people are aware of that now. Um, I believe that Elvis movie that came out really kind of highlighted that. And Doja Cat song brought light. You know, he ripped that. uh, Totally. Hound Dog song. Yeah, he ripped it. Yeah. So which is not, I mean, People rip songs all the time, unfortunately. So I do see their people. Their point here, though. I mean, I agree. Is it enough for legal grounds? Is it should Ed have to take the fall? No, for white people's failures as a whole, probably not. No, no. But um, th- there definitely is a bigger issue here that more people should be aware of, and I, I see what I see what they mean. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. All mm-hmm. of how similar all music really is. Oh, yeah. Um, how when you start listening to songs, you can see these comparisons. And these lawsuits come up a lot, and oftentimes they do sound very similar. And sure. sometimes they are straight rips. Yes, I agree. Um, but yeah, that but was I think that's the getting harder and harder to differentiate because like, 
you know yeah. there's so much music and how can you really make that argument and <clears throat> sometimes you know it's quote unquote like proven to be true that you were copying someone but at yeah. the same time there's a lot of things that just sound similar because mm -hmm. music is at the very like base of it very very similar it's like you could really compare any new song to something else in exactly. the past so should people just stop making yeah. music forever no, because everything's but, already been done yeah. isn't that a song have all the songs been written i don't know pretty sure that's a song it sounds like it maybe i was also thinking like is like even with um tiktok for example right there are so many songs now that are just like i want to say remixes of old songs yeah. mm -hmm. i can think of that one um jack harlow song yeah um, or oh, like yeah. the fergie like which he got fergie permission well, he's paid to do no, for no, that. totally no and i get that but I, that's what i mean is like it's it's becoming more and more popular yeah i mean to sample there's things so, to sample like i mean yeah the, exactly. you can only do i mean you can only do so much you know what i mean like yeah. we're at a point now where but they it's have like, to pay big bucks oh um, to, for to sure. sample things i'm Absolutely. sure they do yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely so yeah, a lot of know. music let us know what you guys think were used yeah yeah that was battle of the eds though battle of the ed good old ed Eddie ed. and ed townsend they're both ed I ed versus ed ed versus ed v ed ed v ed <laughs> that should be like a <laughs> famous trial Just yeah kidding. The trial of Ed V. Ed. Uh, all right, guys. Well, we're going to go ahead and bring Carly in and yes. switch gears here and talk about birth. Mm -hmm. So John and I are moving here in a few weeks and we have literally no time to prepare our meals in the sense of going to the grocery store, figuring out what we want to eat, trying to find all the ingredients, then putting it all together. It's way too much work. And that is why we are relying on HelloFresh, especially in these next coming weeks, because with HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. And you can skip the trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. When the spring sunshine is calling your name, don't call for takeout, get HelloFresh instead. Their quick and easy meals make feeding the family a cinch and without the high price tag. Their new fast and fresh options are ready in just 15 minutes or less. No more scouring the grocery store for that one ingredient to complete your recipe. HelloFresh takes away all that hassle by delivering fresh pre-portioned ingredients so you have exactly what you need and it helps cut down food waste. And with HelloFresh, you can save money because HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout. The thing that I love most about HelloFresh is how good of quality their ingredients are. I have never gotten anything that's been rotten. It's always super, super fresh right from the farm to my doorstep. Recently, John and I made this maple glazed salmon. It was unbelievably good. I am seriously ruling about it. Just thinking about this freaking meal. It's so delicious. They also had this like rice dish and this um like roasted vegetable side dish that was so bomb. All three of those together just made like the most delicious meal, truly. And I never would have thought to put all those ingredients together. But thanks to HelloFresh, now I have that new staple recipe in my recipe book. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Sesh16 and use code Sesh16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Sesh16 and use code Sesh16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. It is no wonder why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. And we are back with Carly Bond, Yay! my doula. <laughs> I am so excited that you're here. I've been really looking forward to this for a long time. I've been wanting Carly to come on the show for a while, but I just recently asked you and you agreed. Yay! I'm so happy you're here. Yeah, thank you for coming on. We are so excited to talk to you. I feel like this is going to be a really good episode for the viewers. I'm sure you guys asked a lot of questions. Yes. We asked you guys to submit your questions. Follow us on social media, by the way, if you ever want to participate in mm -hmm. upcoming like Q&As and this type of stuff. We always yeah. post the links on our social media. It's the underscore sesh podcast. But yeah, you guys submitted some great ones. So thanks for doing that. Yeah. 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 Did. How many did you pull? There were like 150 yeah. total. Mm -hmm. And I went through them and got it down to like 40 like that's it's like, hard to narrow so down many. oh yeah i know everyone asked such good questions thank you so much for participating and yeah. thank you kendall and janelle for having me i'm yeah. so excited to be here of course thank you for being here yes. yeah. yeah this is a fun little mother's day treat here yeah. carly is also a mother of two yeah. lovely little guys <laughs> well girl and guy yes <laughs> little babies yes um so can you start out by telling us a little bit more about what you specifically do, you own your own business. Yes. And yeah. how long have you been a doula? Yeah. So um, I've been a doula for just a little under seven years now. 
Um, and it's been a pretty long road. You I know, bet. it's always looked so different. Um, yeah. At the start, everything was really slow. Like I would just take a few clients a year mm -hmm. um, and just building and learning and having my own two kiddos within that time frame. Um, yeah. And so now, seven years later, here we are. <laughs> so I had my own private business for a long time called A Mother's Bond. Um, and I do led privately for a really long time. And then a couple years ago, I joined up with a local collective that mm. was awesome. It was like finding my home in the birth world, like in birth work, because this work can be really emotional and really yeah, hard totally. and challenging. And um, so just having a community to support each other and also make sure we have um, like good quality backup doulas if, you know, mm. on the rare circumstance that two of my clients are in labor at the same time. Or Has that ever happened to you? Stuff like that. That has, in my whole seven-year career, happened to me two times. Dang, that's yeah, kind of a lot, honestly. I yeah. know. It's hard to plan. It's really hard. And so most of the time, birth works out really well. I've definitely had a lot of situations where I'm like back-to-back -back births. Like yeah. I get home and sleep for a few hours, and then I'm like, all right, here I go again. Dang, <laughs> gosh, you have no idea how long you're going to be there and what it's going to be like. Yeah, yeah. But um, for the most part, it works out really well. But that's why it's important to have that like backup doula care. So Anyways, I worked with that local collective for a while. It was the best. Um, and then they decided, um, you know, it was like emotional and totally the right decision for them. But they decided to shut down. Um, mm. And, you know, the owner was in midwifery school. And then a few of us were pregnant and a couple of other dealers were moving away. And so the owner was like, I think it's just time to, um, to close it down for now. Mm. And so it made sense for her and for them, but I was so heartbroken. Oh, I bet. And so me and one of the other doulas who was also pregnant at the time, her name is Hiru. She's my business partner. Um, we decided to just open a very similar type of business. And so, you know, Sassy, our friend who was the owner of the previous collective, helped us out a ton. Um, and yeah, we opened Lucina Rising Birthwork. Um, it's been over a year now. And Hiru and I built it while we were both pregnant and then going through our early postpartum awesome. days together. And mm. so it's been a wild ride, but it's been really good. And so, yeah, our goal is to just be a group of doulas in the area who are similarly minded. Mm -hmm. um, we want our clients to feel like they're supported by a community of doulas instead of just one doula. That's and so nice. I like that. Yeah. We're always in the background, like asking each other questions, giving each other resources and helping each other learn new things. Um, as well as we all offer some different services. Like some of us do birth photography. Some mm -hmm. of them do um, postpart like postpartum doula work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we like to, you know, our goal is to be more of like a one stop shop for so cool. clients because... Like Kendall, you know, when you're yeah. pregnant and you're trying to like research all the things you need and all the people you need to reach out to, it can be really overwhelming. And so, yeah, um, yeah we just want to help streamline that process a little bit. Yeah. And so, yeah. That was so cool, too, that you did photography. I was so stoked when I found that out oh, that, you know, you, yeah. you took amazing photos of our birth and just really captured everything. And it's so funny because in the moment, I didn't even realize you were like flashing, you Yay! know, taking pictures. And <laughs> I love to they hear were so that. amazing to yeah, see they afterwards. Turned out so good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. People always get so nervous. Like, will this be distracting in my birth? And it's crazy how when you're in it, you don't really notice it yeah. at all. You're like hyper focused. Yeah. on What's happening? Yeah. Because <laughs> I've always been nervous when I'm taking photos. Like, is this distracting? Yeah. Um, and then I had birth photography done at my second birth, my own birth. And oh, the, I, was I love those photos. At how much I didn't realize you just yeah. don't even notice. So. You're in the zone. It's so fun. It's so special to get like capture that story. Um, yeah. Allow people to see moments that they whether don't remember. you forget about <laughs> yeah. or yeah. you know, oftentimes people will have like, oh, like my partner will take photos on their phone, so it's fine. But then like yeah. he's not in them or she's not in them yeah. too, and those moments are so special. And yeah, totally. So that's definitely one of my favorite things. Um, yeah, it's really cool. I love yeah. that you offer that. For yeah, people so who don't know what a doula mm, is, yes. yeah. can you Good explain question. that to them? Yeah, absolutely. So the word doula has become a little more general than it used to be. There's a bunch of different kinds of doulas now. So there's even like deaf doulas who will be oh, wow. like you can be hired to be by someone's side as they're you know, going wow. through that process. Interesting. Of dying, whether it's like elderly people 
or you know someone who got fatal diagnosis oh i am terminal terminal thank you like a terminal diagnosis um so like that and so you know there's doulas for all different phases of life um what we mostly do is birth doula work and postpartum doula work and so um doula is the word doula is derived from an old greek word that pretty much means like servants or like someone who serves mm. and so that's that's what we do we're here to serve through those big transitions in life and so as a birth doula um we get hired privately by clients to you know we get hired on in the pregnancy process mm-hmm. and we help give resources information learn about your specific birth vision um help you learn about what options you have in the birth space and help you kind of figure out how you feel about things, provide evidence-based information so you can make your own choices about what feels good. Um, Because in pregnancy, like I'm sure you noticed, Kendall, you expect that you'll have all this time with your providers to ask all the questions Mm -hmm. that you're going to have. And then your visits end up being like five, six minutes. Yeah, they really rush you through. It's crazy. So short. And you kind of have to be like, oh, wait, like I had questions. Like, can I ask? Or, you know, maybe you can't think of them in the moment or whatever. Mm And um, in the U.S., the process has just become so like conveyor belt like a factory. Yeah. And birth just isn't that like pregnancy Mm -hmm. and birth are so different for everyone who experiences it. And so we're here to help you feel like you can individualize the process for yourself and what's important to you. Um, and then, yeah, in the birth space, you know, obviously we're on call for whenever yeah. you go into labor. And so we're here to help you kind of figure out, like, are you in labor? Are you not? Um, and then once you are, we're here for emotional support, physical support yep. through the birth process. Um so, you know, the emotional support is huge. We're there to help you feel comforted yeah. and not alone and to normalize the process for you and for your partner. Yeah. That's a big part of what we do is, um, you know, like partners tend to really freak out when yeah. they're watching the person they yeah. love, yeah. like be in pain or totally. get nauseous or like get shaky. Yep. Um, and so being able to look them in the eye too and be like, this is normal. This is actually a good sign. Yeah. Gosh, um, you were really that for Josh, really giving him support. And that was like, honestly, <laughs> half the reason that we hired a doula uh, was I for Josh. I remember saying that. He was yeah. very anxious about the whole thing. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, it can be very taxing and yeah scary for partners and to have someone to kind of guide you and yeah like carly was saying it's so much more i just really thought it was going to be for the birth but everything you did for us prenatal Mm. all the like meetings that we had leading up and then postpartum too yeah um were just so so helpful yeah and having someone that's really there to listen to you not rushing you through um open to everything Mm. you know one of the reasons that i was kind of nervous to hire a doula Mm. at first was because i thought it was going to be I'd always imagined doulas to be only home birth, right. natural birth, that I would be judged for oh, wanting yeah. an epidural. Right. Um, mm. And I was just kind of afraid that, you know, you would only want things to be a certain way yeah. or like I'd be kind of looked down upon mm. for doing things the way that I felt comfortable doing yeah. it. And it was such a relief that you were just so open to explaining all my options to me and yeah. really not pushing me in any direction. And even when I would ask you questions, you would lay out all the yeah. options and never, never like put like your wrong. opinion into that. Yeah. And I love that about you that I just nice. felt like fully accepted. Yeah. And it's emotional for me because I mean, having you in, in the room for, we were in there for what, two <laughs> days. <laughs> Quite a while. And she was there from like the moment we checked into the mm. hospital. Many of you guys know my whole birth story. It'll be linked below, but I was yeah. induced. And so I really had no idea yeah. what it was going to be like. And, yeah. you know, leading up to that decision, how how stressful it was. Should yeah. I get induced at 37 weeks or 38 right. weeks? And you just really helped us to ask the right questions yeah. to my provider and make sure that it w- I still had control and letting me teaching me how to become my own advocate in yeah. that moment was like so, so valuable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we were parked out in there watching the office together. <laughs> Um, Carly, <laughs> how many times did you come and go? Like probably three or I think about three. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. with inductions, I like to come and like help you get settled in, but usually it's a very slow early process. And yeah. Um Super when slow. I was a brand new doula, I used to hang out and I just felt like it put so much pressure on my clients. Like you yeah. would feel like, oh, like I feel bad for Carly. Like I need 
things to be happening for her. I did and all so, the time. You did. Remember, you kept saying, I, I was like, like, I feel bad for you. Go stop. home. Go sleep. <laughs> I felt so, like I was inconveniencing you. But I mean, no, you, you never made job. me feel that way. That's yeah. just, you know, how I am. But you almost feel like yeah. you're hosting someone. So it's right. nice to have you'd come yeah you'd go that was it was a nice balance i'm like let me give you some space you guys you and josh try to rest connect be together call me when you need me i always tell my clients if i leave and two minutes later you're freaking out or like something's happening call me back Mm -hmm. like i'm here for you Mm -hmm. um so it's always emotional to leave and and nerve-wracking because it's like you just never know how birth will go um so i usually try not to both inductions they do tend to be longer so yeah um yeah, it was good. Thank you for sharing all of that. Oh, that makes of me course. so happy. Of and course. that's exactly it. Like we're here for unbiased support. A good doula provides really good unbiased evidence-based mm-hmm. support. And mm-hmm. um, you know, so one of our goals with my whole group, Lucina Rising Birth Work, is that, you know, some doulas do kind of market themselves to be more for home birth mm-hmm. or more for hospital birth. Um, mm-hmm. and we are very much like wherever you want to birth, however you want to birth, we're here for you. And I, I do, I s- supported Home births, birth center births, hospital births, planned C-sections, emergency C-sections. So, you know, just all over the board. And I think, um, you know, pregnancy and birth is is so different for everyone Mm -hmm. and so unique for everyone. And just allowing it to be what it needs to be for each family is... That feels really sacred to me. Oh, totally. To respect that. And yeah. So, yeah. yeah, the emotional support is huge. And then physical support, of course, Mm -hmm. like we're trained in comfort measures um, you know, what positions are beneficial at different phases in labor. And so if there's a stall, what can we be doing to try to get things to pick up and get yep. things to move along? Um, get the peanut ball. Yes. The I hate that thing. <laughs> you did hate that. I did. <laughs> it's, there's a love hate relationship. Like Some people, people love either it, are yeah. like, it depends on where baby's at in the pelvis. Like, does this yeah. feel good? Does it not? Mm-hmm. Everyone's different, but yeah, trying to open up. Yeah. And then massage too. Yes. You give them massage. massages. It was nice. Snacks, water, making sure you stay yeah. hydrated mm-hmm. and just all the things, just taking care of you and taking care of things in the space so that your partner can relax and like it feels weird to use the word enjoy, but like enjoy yeah. the experience with you because it's totally. their experience too. Yeah. And I think without someone in the space who knows what they're doing and knows what they're talking about, partners try to fill that role and they're so panicked. Yeah. Like you know, like, oh, what do I need to be communicating to the medical staff? Or like, she's yeah. shaky, like someone, like, do I need to go get a nurse or whatever? Yeah. Um, but, and so just having someone there who can be like, hey, this is normal. Yeah. This is good. I got this. Or like, let me go grab the nurse. You just hang mm-hmm. out and be with Kendall, engage with her and just allowing partners to connect. Um, it's important because it's such a experience for you both. It but really is. also it, it helps keep oxytocin flowing. It helps keep labor going. So yeah. Um, oxytocin is such an interesting yeah. hormone yes it's a hormone yeah it's like the love hormone happy mm-hmm. hormone it's like your best friend going. it, it yeah. is it's yeah. interesting yeah and then you're really like a liaison too between the doctor and you mm. to explain things because sometimes they'll come in or like rush you into a decision mm. or talk over your head and it's nice to have someone there that's like whoa whoa pump the brakes yeah do you understand this are you comfortable with this yeah. and I found that to be so helpful because yeah you never really know who you're gonna get Carly and I were just talking between that you know two days that I was in there I had or five days that we were there <laughs> we had at least 10 nurses yeah. if not more and you never know I mean some of them for me like most of them were amazing I had one or two that weren't great. Mm. And it was really nice to, because at one point I didn't want one of the nurses in there yeah. and Carly went and handled that for me and told her not to yeah. come back in. <laughs> Have you had to do that a lot? Is that like a common thing? Um, A few times. How do you like, you're like, so listen, you suck, get the fuck out. Just I just don't come back <laughs> in the room. You are not alone. <laughs> um, usually I'll communicate with the charge nurse who mm-hmm. is like the lead nurse that makes for that shift. And yeah. I will say like, hey, you know, like so-and-so, whatever the nurse's name is great. Um, It's just not a good personality match or something like that, where they're making my client feel weird or pressured. Like, can we can we have a switch, switch. in nurses? Mm-hmm. And so that is an option that you have in your birth space. Have you not ever gotten any like um, pushback against that? No. Really? Oh, that's they're great. usually very respectful. Um, yeah. I think one time I had a nurse kind of like roll her eyes, mm. but they tried to like... They just try to make it not awkward. So usually you don't like run into that nurse again. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sometimes I'll yeah. be nervous. Like if I have to go get ice or water or something, I'm like, ooh, am I going to run into that nurse? <laughs> wait, do you ever like, feel <laughs> like they don't want you in there or they don't respect what you do? Yeah. I was going to ask about that. Especially not yeah. nurses. 
as well, but especially doctors. Yeah. Like, is there ever some sort of like, you know, you're not a doctor. Like, right. why are you here? Like, yeah. don't yeah. ask questions. I'm the doctor. You don't know what I'm you're the doing. I'm the yeah. nurse. I know what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. Um. Actually, one of your listeners asked that question. I, they oh, really? put it pretty bluntly. I think they said, "Do doctors respect you?" <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I was like, "That's a very valid question." And my answer is, some of them do, and some of them don't. Mm. Um. So yeah, I've definitely had nurses and doctors who give some pushback to doulas being there. Um. I try my best to be very respectful in this space and to create a bridge and yeah. really try to encourage like hey, we're here to work together as a team for yeah. this client to feel fully supported. And um, that's something I really like to talk about is that as doulas, we're just a piece of the puzzle and having like a supportive provider is another piece of the puzzle. And so, you know, I want to encourage that teamwork mindset. Yeah. Um, so try really hard to bridge that gap. But every once in a while you have someone who, whether it's, you know, just a preconceived idea they have about doulas or maybe they had an experience with a doula who cross some boundaries or you know whatever it may be yeah. um sometimes you can just feel that energy of like sure. you don't want me. you don't yeah. want me here <laughs> for sure. and, and that's really hard for me because i don't want my clients to pick up on that and i don't want yeah. it to shift the energy in the room or yeah. make sure my clients feel anxious like things feel weird and mm -hmm. um so sometimes i'll go in the hallway and be like hey like i just want to connect i want you to know we're on the same team you know yeah. And yeah. usually that kind of breaks the ice a little bit if needed. Yeah. But yes. But that being said, there are tons of OBs, midwives, nurses who are so supportive of doulas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I walk in the room and they're like, oh, yay, they have a doula. <laughs> yeah. I love when that clients have doulas. That makes sense, too. Yeah. That's, it seemed like the team that we had was kind of like that. They, they were. They were really great. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty great. So, um, yeah, everyone's different. There's so much more information coming out about doulas over the last few years. I feel mm -hmm. even just since when I started being a doula seven years ago, um, there there was a lot more tension. And now there's a lot less like it's just become a, more normalized mm -hmm. and hospitals are more used to doulas being in the space. And mm -hmm. so that's awesome. Um, I do find I think some nurses feel a little threatened because... I think a lot of people get into nursing because they want to be doing that role. They want to be like mm. caring and tending to their patients. Yeah. Maybe they don't realize how much they're going to have to be like charting and taking care of all the other patients. And yeah, so it's kind of a it's bummer. A and I, sometimes I feel that from the nurses, like, you know, when I'm putting washcloths on your head oh. or, and they're like, well, I can do this or I can do that. Sure. And I'm like, yeah. oh, you, that's why you got into this work. You want to do that. And yeah. Unfortunately, our system just doesn't really allow for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so just try my best to work as a team, but definitely sometimes there's some like, tension. Oh, awkward. Yeah. So is it hard being in a profession where you have no control over what's going to happen or what you're going to walk into? Because I think I would really struggle with that. Yeah. Um, I'm such a planner. Even with my own birth, it was so hard to not have an idea yeah. of how it was going to go. Is it hard to have no idea what you're walking into? Yeah. Um. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard. I I consider myself someone who really thrives in spontaneity. Mm, and good. so I weirdly love I love it. Like I love the spontaneity of this. Are you job. a fire sign? <laughs> I'm an Aries. Oh, there yeah. we go. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was wondering. I was gonna go for either fire or air. <laughs> I love it. that question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I don't know. I'm weird because in some ways I like to have things planned. But when it comes to work, like I've worked several jobs, I've worked nine to fives and I just struggled like the yeah. routine. It's just not for me Um, with work specifically other routines in life. I enjoy. But sure. yeah, when it comes to work, I love the spontaneity. Sometimes, of course, it's hard like family, but, you know, my husband's birthday this last year, I was at a birth and, oh, you know, yeah. like I've been at births on Mother's Day, which it's always it's 50 50 for me, like half of it. I'm like, this is so fun. What a special way to spend a special day. Right. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, my kids, whatever. So yeah. and that's one of the reasons that we have this group is that um, every once in a while we'll let our clients know ahead of time before they hire us. Like, hey, I am going to take this day off or this sure. weekend off and yeah. I'll have a backup doula available if you happen to go into labor at that time. And mm -hmm. um, we do our best to let those situations be known ahead of time. So mm -hmm. it's not like a surprise, but yeah. of course. Um, but yeah, all that to say, like, it's been hard to find a way to make this work sustainable in a life, especially as a mom. 
Um, you know, I don't want to be just like bailing on my kids all the time. Yeah. And yeah. so that sometimes can be challenging, but for the most part, I actually really enjoy it. And sometimes there's some anxiety when I know I'm on call and I have a client who's going to go into labor at any minute. And you oh, know, at, sure. at bedtime, I'm like checking my phone yeah. like 20 times. I'm like, Riley, can you mm-hmm. call me and make sure that <laughs> my phone's on? Yeah. Um, oh, I but would be like that then too. once I get the call, it's like, all that anxiety is gone and I'm just like, I'm so excited. Go time. Like, Let's go. That's awesome. It. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, you get to experience the most magical thing that happens in oh. life. Like the closest thing to magic on yeah. the earth. And yes. you get to see it over and over. Does it ever it's get... So cool. Is it just as special every time? I would say yes. Like I think sometimes it can become a little routine, especially mm-hmm. when you're in labors. Like and during the labor time, sometimes it can feel routine. But every single time when it comes to pushing and like those first moments with baby, it's so emotional for yeah, me. And I especially bet. ever since having my second kiddo, um, I don't know why that changed my mindset so much, but I cry at every birth now. Really? <laughs> every single time. I was going to ask that. <laughs> It'd be hard not to. <laughs> it's always the moment when, you know, in pushing right before baby comes, when a mom looks me in the eye and maybe doesn't even say anything, but you can just tell they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> Help me. This is like the best way to describe it. What, what the, the fuck, fuck is happening? <laughs> that moment. I like it sounds silly, but I tear up because I'm like, yeah. I know. Like I know yeah. how you are feeling. Yeah. And like it's wild. It's it wild. And also I know that in two minutes you're gonna feel completely different. <laughs> and you're gonna meet so your baby. True. And like it's so emotional. Yeah. Oh, I cry so much. When you're in a <laughs> When they're having a C-section, are you in that room too? Because I know that's like a surgery. Yeah. So they they let you in there? So oftentimes, it depends on the hospital, their policies. Um, It's always weirdly up to the anesthesiologist. Oh, okay. So they get to make the call. And I think it's because they're the ones who sit right up by um, your head while everything's happening. They're keeping an eye on everything. And so I think it's kind of whether or not they want someone else in their space or not. Interesting. Um, yeah. So some are a little more picky. Some aren't. Unfortunately, you don't know who your anesthesiologist is going to be ahead of time. Right. It's not like your OB where you can check ahead of time. Right. Yeah. It's just like, well, let's show up and see. Oh, that's hard. It's so hard. And so I've gotten really good at advocating to be in this space. Um, when I first was a doula, I was left out of ORs quite a bit. But yeah. I kind of learned how to be like, hey, I'm going to be respectful. Like I've been in ORs now several times. Um know what I'm doing. I'm going to be respectful. And if your answer is still no, I totally understand. And that's fine. And um, but then oftentimes they're like, oh, OK, like it's not just. Well, yeah. and I think during COVID, too, a lot of people were yeah. um, oh. saying that their sister or whoever, they were like, they're my doula. They weren't really a doula, but that's how they kind of passed the hospital policies oh, during COVID. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And so then do hospital, right? Yeah. It makes sense. But then hospital administration got so choosy about yeah. like, yeah. oh, well, like, what if it's not a real doula? Right. They, like, do was that a crazy weird. time? And, oh, my gosh. It was crazy. Yeah. So there was probably many circumstances where you weren't al- allowed to go in there or they they had to choose between a family member and you. Yes. Or, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So doing like virtual support was Damn. huge. Wow. Over the phone support. Um, um, oh my gosh it was crazy there I were a bet. couple months where they were just like if you were sick at all when you were in labor they would test you for covid and then they would take your baby like after birth and not let <gasps> you baby. see your baby until oh your test came back negative yeah oh that's horrific wow. and so i've had a couple clients now who you know, they're having their second baby and they tell me like their first baby story from COVID mm. and that's their it's story. So traumatic. And it's so traumatic. And they're like, I'm hiring a doula because, you know, I want someone yeah. there to help yeah. me, like, advocate and like make sure I get that like initial skin to skin time. And so hard. Like, yeah. And and luckily in Colorado, we're a little more progressive. Like that time was pretty short here. But mm-hmm. in other states that was happening for like months. It was yeah. just it was crazy. Yeah. yeah. It's so sad. So. Yeah. Wow. I felt really lucky that a lot of the a lot of the rules were being lifted when I was going into the third trimester and I was very nervous about what's that going to be like because I heard from all friends of mine that it was it was really difficult for them. So, yeah, absolutely. I can't imagine. So one more question for you before we get into the viewers questions (laughs) here. Um, Do you travel for doula work or do you keep it all in Colorado? Because I guess that'd be really hard to plan, huh? It would be so hard. I would (laughs) love to do that. There are doulas who do that. Um, 
if I was single and not a mom, I would yeah. totally do that. Mm-hmm. That would be like a dream come true for me. I love traveling. I would be like, you know, pay for my plane ticket and I'll yeah. do that. Like, <laughs> I'll hang out for a few weeks yeah. until totally. you give birth, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a lot of friends in other states who have asked, you know, like, mm-hmm. would you come for my birth? And I'm like, if I didn't have kids, I would totally come just hang out at your house for like a month. You know, yeah. like whenever you go into labor, but um, unfortunately, no. I okay. Don't. Yeah. I was, but I'm there sure are we're travel doulas questions. out there for sure. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Does anyone in Lucina? No. No. Okay. None of us do. I thought I would ask because I'm sure yeah. people oh, yeah. out there are wondering. Yeah. But people who are in state, do you service all of Colorado or do you keep it like Denver Metro or? Most, mostly Denver Metro. We travel down to Castle Rock, sometimes a little bit further. Um, you know, a couple of our doulas will go to Colorado Springs. Okay. And then, you know, all through Denver, like out east, um, okay. Elizabeth area, Kiowa area, west over to like Littleton, Lakewood, and then up north. Um, so a pretty big area. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like Broomfield. Yeah. Two hour radius from Denver. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And before we get into the questions too, how can people contact yeah. you if they're interested? Oh, yeah. Um, you can hop on our website and send an inquiry through there. The website is lucinarisingbirthwork.com. Hop on our website, take a look around. Um, you can send an inquiry through there. You can always just send us an email as well at info at lucinarising.com. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And, you know, even if you aren't quite in our area, we can always give referrals. And mm-hmm. we're very well connected with, you know, birth workers all over. So that's great. Um, and what about social media too? Social media, we're just at Lucina Rising Birthwork. So we're on Instagram and Facebook. Um, we're not very active on Facebook. So mostly <laughs> just on Instagram. But yeah, follow us and you can, you know, we are always sharing like tips or, mm. you know, fun birth photos or whatever yeah. it may be, like tips on preparing for your birth, for Great your pregnancy. Great resource. Yeah. Um, yeah. So awesome. Yeah. Just so want to be a resource. Even if you're out of state too. Yeah, yeah. Definitely some good information on there. It was very yeah. helpful helpful for me. And just encouraging information. There's yes. so much negative information out there. And Order so we is. like to share like encouraging stories, mm-hmm. things to help you feel positive and empowered. About, so yeah, it's all yeah. about that. Because yeah, Keeping the internet the can be like very doom and gloom. Oh yeah. Like yeah. everything's fucked all the time oh my God. type of mentality yeah <laughs> it's really yes. not the case the amount of yeah. people that told me i was just screwed for having to be induced like leading up to it i had to stop posting about it because people are just like don't do that mind like, your own my business doctor like said, that's not helpful i know i know not helpful. i think they were like trying to be helpful I know, like, but yeah. like i was induced and it was horrible and like it was rough it like was rough. it is it is rough it's i feel like it's not <laughs> ideal but it's you know you want to like do what's best for your baby yeah it's a safety thing and yeah when it's yeah. medically indicated it's like yeah okay well, stop giving me the negative stories now because like we're in yeah. this right. so and the, but people act like you have a choice either remember right. my doctor was literally like well if you go any longer i can't be your yeah. doctor it's like yeah. oh okay so i so this have is real. to do this yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah yeah okay i'd have i could just sit here and talk with you all day mm-hmm. but i want to get to these questions so i was gonna say is it okay if i add something else oh yeah um so and we're actually launching some new gift boxes that we're Ooh. starting to <laughs> sell for moms oh, cool. and just all oh, the that's birthing cool. people. That's so smart. Um for pregnancy and postpartum. Oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah. So it's, you know, whether you find out you're pregnant and you're looking for some goodies to celebrate. Um, or you know someone who's pregnant for a baby shower Ooh, or, you know, we'll awesome. have a postpartum box to bring someone who just had a baby. And oh, yeah. it's really that. just our so favorite sweet. items that we're always recommending to clients anyways. And we're like, let's just make this easy for our clients. Yes. And put it all in a box. And so we'll be launching those this week. Um, oh, that's great so timing. Yeah, you can find out about those on our website. Do you ship well. those? Will you ship them well, yeah, out? Yeah, we'll ship all throughout oh, the U.S. Great. Mm-hmm. Oh, there that's go, great. Yeah. I mean, that is so useful because I mean, so often when you have like baby showers or people want to get you a gift, even if you don't, um, sometimes you get things that are, I mean, they're really cute, but yeah. it's like how useful. Like, yeah. It's nice to have nipple bombs. Yes. And, yeah. I mean, there's so many just little things that you don't think of, especially yeah. if you haven't had kids yourself. And sure. it's, exactly. it's nice to to get some of the useful stuff. Although Janelle yeah. got me a very useful gift, gift basket when I gave birth oh, with like oh, tea you, in there I, and good, yeah, good I stuff. I love pa- that. No nipple and, bomb. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Well, I didn't think about that. I had like 
15 nipple bombs and <laughs> I only breastfed for two weeks. So <laughs> didn't really get to use any of it. Okay. Some of them, this is weird, but some of them are good as just like chapstick. And oh, okay. So I the same I heard stuff, that. Like, Celine, it really is. It really I is. I follow this one chick on TikTok and she takes Accutane and she was like, mm-hmm. nipple bombs the best for my lips because it helps with chapped yeah. skin. Yeah. It's great. Mm, like sensitive skin. Might have to get some. <laughs> Nipple, yeah, chapped so nipples. Not a lot of people think about nurturing the person who just gave birth. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, they're like, let's mm-hmm. bring something fun for the baby or another onesie yeah. or whatever. And it's like, like, oh, I have so many onesies. Yeah. So here, buy this box that yeah. will be actually helpful and supportive yeah. to yeah. someone who is healing from yeah. a crazy Earth. journey. Uh, yeah. Earth sounds that like is a the crazy journey. craziest thing in the world. Ugh. It is. It is. Janelle so is still like on the fence if mm. she wants to go down that road. Yeah. On the fence. That's fair. Get Do really you feel nervous through. about birth specifically or you're just not sure if you want to be a mom? I'm more nervous about being a parent yeah. than giving birth. Giving yeah. birth sounds scary too, but it's not um, permanent. Like, well, I mean, it leads to right. rights and <laughs> <laughs> you can't return it. I said, there's no returning. There's no like, oh, wait, never mind. This isn't for me. I don't know. I just, I go back and forth a lot. Yeah. Um, That's fair. I'm very yeah. selfish in a lot of ways of like, I like to do whatever I want, whenever mm-hmm. I want. And mm-hmm. obviously when you have a kid, your whole life changes and everyone's yeah. like, oh, it's for the better. And I, not that I don't believe that, but I just, I don't know. Yeah. That's so I smart. Back and forth. Yeah. I don't know. It is. You really should be thinking it through yeah. as much as possible. It's not a decision to just make on a whim. I mean, you really e- want to take as much time with that. Yeah. Never pressure yourself because yeah, like a lot. selfishness kind of goes out the window. Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, it like it actually does. It you really cannot does. be selfish anymore. <laughs> yeah. And I like doing whatever I want. Yeah. Whatever yeah. I want. Yeah. I love sleeping. Kind of yeah. ends. Ooh, I'm very. Yeah. S- like if I had a kid like Holly though that was like yeah. well behaved and slept yeah. pretty well. Yeah. But like you can't guarantee that. What if my kid sucks? <laughs> <laughs> well, Carly and I were just talking about that ahead of time. Like you never really yeah. know cuz uh, you know, I have had a really easy journey, but I'm scared of the next one cuz yeah. I've heard so many stories where the second one can be a lot harder and kind of rock your world yeah. so parenthood is crazy because it's one of the biggest commitments you jump into without mm-hmm. any practice mm-hmm. like marriage sure. right you get to date you mm-hmm. know right and like mm-hmm. all these transitions in life you get to kind of test a little and then yeah. parenthood is just like well you don't know how it's gonna be yeah you don't know what you're go. doing no so how can i it. will i ever be like oh i'm 100 percent sure and ready no, to go like i, I think, think so. at some point i don't think so either like something just kind of tells you like yeah. oh okay let's Let's try it. And see what yeah, happens. Kind of just got to jump in, and then like once you're in, though, you're yeah. in. See, I don't yeah. like just jumping in. I know it's hard, <laughs> and like not gonna lie, I've said this many times, but for me, no matter how much I mentally tried to prepare myself, there's none. When I had a baby in my arms, and it was like mm. my life has forever changed from this moment. It was shocking, like on a deep level for totally. weeks, to where yeah. I was like, wow, literally everything in my life just changed. Yeah, and yes, for me, it's for the better. Like, I just love being a parent so much, but it's something that I could see. Yeah, you want to think through this as yeah. much as you can and, and not pressure yourself yeah. at It is all. weird because um, I think, like I, which I think this makes sense, I've never, like you, when you were growing up, you knew from yeah. the start, like you wanted to be a mom your whole life. My whole life. And I've never had that, like, I was born to be a mother. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes I wonder, I'm like, does that mean I shouldn't have them? Or And, and I feel like society a lot of times is like, oh, you know, you want kids. Like, why wouldn't you want kids? Right. Like, women's supposed to have kids. That's just what you're supposed to do. And so I'm like, okay, but if I'm not 100% sure, does that mean that I, like, shouldn't have them? Is it okay to not be, like, I was born to be a mom and then still have kids? Does that make you still as good of a mom as someone who was, like, I've wanted this my whole life? I guess if that makes sense. Sometimes I feel yeah. like, would I be a fraud? I don't know. No. I know. I, no, but, no, like, no. I can't. It's hard to describe. But I... When I talk to other people, like, oh, I was born to be a mom. I, mm. I know I've wa- I want this more than anything in the world. I'm like, I don't necessarily feel that way. Yeah. So, like, should I do that? And if I have kids, like, would I be a bad mom because of it? You know no. what I mean? No. Definitely but- not. Like, I think it's fair <laughs> to question that. I think what you're yeah. questioning is so valid. Yeah. And probably a lot of people are wondering that. And actually, there were a couple questions about that. Really? Like, yeah. Like, how do I know if I'm ready oh, to be a parent? And I think the answer is it's just different for everyone. And some people get to feel this like deep knowing from being young. Um, and for some people, it evolves. Some yeah. people get thrown into it by accident, yep. and you know, and then they evolve into it. 
Um, I think sometimes you along the way kind of make a choice. Sure. And I think for I would say like the majority of people don't feel certain at all Mm -hmm. and feel Mm -hmm. this unknowing of, you know, but kind of like leaning more that way and being like, okay, like, I guess, I guess we'll try it. I guess we'll try it. (laughs) But I also think I love about our generation, like our generation has become so empowered of like, if you don't want to have kids, you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel previous generations, that wasn't Mm, the case. Totally. So true. And so I also love that. Like, I think it's really cool that some people are just like, I don't think that's the right choice for me, whether it's because of, you know, like traumatic history and not wanting to carry that forward or you know whatever it is i think not interested yeah Yeah. and i think that's really empowering and it's like okay well cool like yeah that's awesome that's valid but i don't think just because you don't feel this strong powerful like (laughs) need to be a mom because i would even say i did feel that and i'm like hesitant to say it It's hard. It is hard. hard. I felt like I felt like I really wanted to be a mom so bad, and I love being a mom. I love Mm -hmm. it. I love my kids so much. But there definitely have been seasons of life that have Mm -hmm. been like, wow, this is different than I imagined. (laughs) Sure, (laughs) really, really hard. Yeah, and so um, whereas I think you know, like my sister, she didn't you know, when we grew up, she didn't really want kids and she has a daughter and she's like the best freaking mom I've ever seen in my life. Sure. And mm-hmm. So, you know, I think it's just, it's different for everyone. Yeah. And even if you do have that deep knowing, maybe it's not going to be what you, you thought know, it was. It, it rarely will be what you right. think it is. But no, it's totally so true. true. It's so yeah. true. Like you can't so, prepare yourself for it. Yeah. And, mm, I think so. just give yourself, give yourself space to process and, you know, question all the things and Listen to your intuition as doulas are always like, what's your gut saying? Yeah. <laughs> and it's important. It's important. It is. So it is very important. You'll figure it out. You have time. Yeah. Yes. Sometime. Yeah. No, I have time. That's it's the only thing that's hard too is we were just discussing that earlier is, you know, you do have like somewhat of a biological c- clock to some yeah. degree. Yeah. Like, obviously we have... um modern medicine now that can help in the later stages more and more common for people to be having kids later in life yeah um you know especially in our generation so i don't feel like rushed but at the same time i'm like there's that pressure there like i can't just be like "Eh, i don't know for the next 20 years because by then it might be a little too late right i don't know so yeah it is hard hard. it's very hard it's hard being a woman it is very oh yeah Give us more credit, world. Yeah, <laughs> so true. No it's so true. Okay, so we're getting some questions okay, here. Yes. Okay, so for people who want to become a doula or interested in this mm. path, can you kind of tell them how, you know, from just the idea of I'm kind of interested in this to actually being in the room, being a doula, giving, helping give birth? What, what does that path look like? Like education, trainings, mm. that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, I would say it's a different journey for everyone. It's not something that has been super institutionalized. Like there's not this clear path like there is for nursing. Um, There are tons of different certification programs that you can go through. And it's kind of a hot topic in the birth world because, you know, when you think about being a doula, it's something that is it's kind of like deeply ancestral and something we've taken from the way that communities used to approach Mm. birth right like in village mindsets it was like you're going to go to the hut like when you're in labor you're going to go to the hut and like the women your aunties and your grandmas and you know your sisters whoever's going to go with you like a community of women will be there to support you um and then those were doulas you know like they were doulaing you through the process and our culture just doesn't have that type of support. Yeah. Um, and so all that to say, there's kind of this hot topic in the birth world of like, you don't need to be trained. Like it's in our, it's, mm. you know, it's ancestral or, and, or, you know, if you want to um, get political with it, there's, you know, there's some politics there as well. Oh, like sure. there isn't everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Doesn't surprise me. <laughs> exactly. And so some people feel adamantly against certification programs because it's oh, like really? oh you know someone's like monetizing oh this thing yeah that's supposed to be, you know whatever but anyways all that to say <laughs> if you want to be a doula there's tons of organizations out there to get certified through and i would recommend just checking them out reading through reviews um there's you know a right one for everyone for different mm. reasons and yeah so do you get like a uh like a certification and then because I guess my one of my questions is like, how does it, how do you differentiate someone who's like, oh yeah, I'm a doula and then like has never really had training? Right. C- 
can they still technically like legally call themselves doulas? Or yeah. is there just like a lot of gray area still? Right. There's a lot of gray area. There's like no legality to it. There's no like licensure gotcha. necessarily. So, you know, a question you can ask doulas is, are, are you certified? Who are you certified through? Or like, how long have you been practicing? And, you know, but but within that, knowing just because they're certified doesn't mean they're going to be the best doula. You know, maybe they took these classes that yeah. kind of gave some bad ideas on how to be. And so yeah. being more intentional about, you know, learning the personality of the doula that you're interviewing, I think is important um, experience. You know, it's not everything, but it can make a big difference. Like you learn yeah. so much on the job in doulaing. And sure. so, yeah, there's a lot of gray area. Like you could totally just be like, hey, I'm a doula. Yeah. Again, yeah. since COVID, I said that word. COVID. COVID. That was cute. <laughs> <laughs> Canadian. Right from. COVID. <laughs> since COVID. <laughs> um, a lot of hospitals now have kind of cracked down with like, mm. hey, you need to show your certification again. Gotcha. Yeah. But I'm like, even the hospital stuff, they don't understand that like the certification, you there's so many one. different yeah. ones. And yeah. so some of the programs are more intense about, you know, every two years you need to recertify and you need to have this like continuing education with in that two years and um and then some are a lot more laid back and mm. it's kind of a complicated thing what are some of the things you're learning while you're going through this training like are you learning mm. this is so stupid i'm gonna sound like it are you learning science during it? <laughs> <laughs> you learn science <laughs> are you learning science during it or like what yeah doula 101 okay yeah. this is the vagina yeah. this is like, this is like <laughs> you do you learn some anatomy um because there you go anatomy. <laughs> there you go that's right <laughs> they do some anatomy in there there's some anatomy <laughs> um our education system has kind of failed us as women oh, yeah. like, i, I can't tell of, you how many kinda. clients are like i don't know what my cervix is yeah. you know and i'm like all right let's get into it so there's some like anatomy you really learn about the birth process um the different stages of labor what they can look like mm -hmm. um and then you know the overarching thing and theme is how can you be supportive within that um what different techniques are helpful and beneficial what different interventions may or may not come up with providers um, and how to just help your client navigate those situations. Gotcha. And then you're learning about like cesarean and like what, oh, yeah. what that's like. I mean, that's an intense surgery. Yes. And then Pitocin and what yeah. that is and yeah. uh, side attack and all the, I mean, yes. there is a lot of science. There's a lot. It. And so doulas for, you know, for anyone who might be confused about this, doulas are not medically trained. So we're not there to tell you, do this, don't do this. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is happening with mm -hmm. your baby. You should consider this. That's what your provider, your medical providers are for. Um, but we're there to kind of help you navigate the system and bring evidence-based information in when you maybe feel like your providers are just putting you on that conveyor belt of like, well, this is typically how we like to see things done. Mm -hmm. And you're feeling like, well, that's not something I wanted for my birth. Do I have options? You know, and so your doula is there to help you navigate that. Like, hey, you know, like, let's take a minute if it's not emergent. Let's take a minute and think through things. Like you were mentioning earlier, just asking, like, you know, Kendall, do you understand mm -hmm. what they're saying? Do you have any yeah. questions? Do you want to take some time to think about it? And just creating that buffer can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um understanding yeah. like how the different positions to push in yeah because traditionally they like to most doctors want you like on your back yes. and that classic position called like, lithotomy lithotomy yeah, yeah. lithotomy and at first scientific. i did not want to start like that remember i was yeah. like on my side for so long and eventually oh, you did great on your side yeah but you know, my doctor didn't really love that <laughs> yeah and we see that a lot um ob's are trained to catch babies you know in this one specific way and so when you're a different way sometimes they get i think really more than anything i think they're nervous about a potential lawsuit like i feel mm -hmm. like that happens so much in hospital is like yeah. guides so much of you know what they recommend right um and so i don't know you know one of your listeners did ask that question like what do you think of pushing on your back because i'm sure on tiktok and stuff now there's like all this like don't push on your back oh yeah um, sure. mm -hmm. and so it is true like movement in the pelvis through pushing is is really beneficial um you know, if you think about like your tailbone, your sacrum, like has yeah. to move out of the way uh, for baby to come. When they were telling me about that in the moment, I was like, I hate You're this. Like, so, like, <laughs> she's trying to get past the bone. And I was like, oh my God. Like, Ew. I, I hated thinking about it so much. Oh, no. <laughs> it's just like, it's mind blowing. Though. It is mind blowing. And your pelvis is made to move. Right. Yeah. And so if we're 
just if you're stuck in one position and you're laying on your back and you're not allowing for that movement the way that maybe your body or your baby needs, it can be more challenging. It can take longer to push. Um, you know, it might increase tearing, things like that. So yeah. And really, you should look into it. There's a rich history of the lithotomy position where it was like some king in the 17th century had like a weird birth fetish and like oh, literally nice. created that because he wanted to like watch. Duh. Why am I literally birth? not? Because he even, wanted to watch it in yeah. that position. And that's like, like not what, that's like how that position was created. And that's just like what we practice that's now. Right. Why does that's everything crazy? go back to a freaky man? No, literally everything in history is freaky no. men. Yeah, <laughs> it's insane. God. <laughs> so yes, you do have the option to move. And, you know, even if your provider is like, hey, I want you to get on your back now you can be like well i'm comfortable where i am Mm -hmm. um that being said there is so much like we were saying on tiktok now it's like don't push on your back don't push on your back i've been to tons of births even like home birth like unmedicated where the you know the birther ends up on their back and that's where they end up feeling comfortable and so for me it's more of a matter of where are you feeling good where are you pushing efficiently um try some different things yeah Yeah. try you know if Mm -hmm. you know it can be normal to push for a few hours even and so Ugh. you know switching it up yeah. <laughs> like getting some movement in the pelvis is, so, uh, is i like i'm starting to cringe over here because it just it brings me right back. back it is hard memories. it is so hard yeah. but wonderful going <laughs> off of <laughs> the fear of birth um yeah. a lot of people were asking like one person said how do you shift your mindset away mm. from fear when prepping for birth i hope to be mom someday and the birthing process seems uh simultaneously so natural yet so intimidating another person said when a mom is having anxiety, what are your favorite techniques to help calm her nerves? Yeah. How do you navigate like fear of prepping for birth mm. and just it's a good question. Being it's a- terrified of pushing a human out of your vagina. It is terrifying. <laughs> what is very valid. <laughs> it's, it's overwhelming. Really good questions. Yeah. I think, you know, our culture is so bad at talking about birth. Mm-hmm. And again, going back to historically, like we would see our aunts and our mothers and whoever Mm -hmm. giving birth. And it was normalized for us from a very young age. Um, I say us, like I'm like a part of it. I wish I was a part of it. (laughs) Our ancestors. (laughs) Um, You know, most of us don't ever see birth until we're in it ourselves. And so so I think that's where a lot of the fear comes from, as well as Hollywood. (laughs) Like to only play, you know, these crazy scenarios. If you're not aware birth in Hollywood is not what birth really looks like. No. (laughs) And the Um, baby's always like two months old. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's a mess. It's really interesting. I think there's, it's so normal to feel fear. Like first I want people who are feeling that to feel valid. Like that's a Mm -hmm. valid, normal way to feel because it's not normal in our culture to like see it and experience it. And then when you do like what you do learn about is all the scary stories like yeah. you were even saying earlier like people just love to share their scary stories and yep. so yeah. even if they themselves had a positive experience when you start talking about like the birth you're planning they're like oh well like my sister's friend mm-hmm. had this yeah. bad and um, i don't know uh, what like yeah. why we do that in our culture it's um, so with everything i had people like leading up like a few weeks out telling me like oh yeah i just knew this person who baby was flight for or life Flight for life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, airlifted out of right. the hospital, oh came out blue and like telling me, and I'm like literally about to go through. So I'm like, why are you telling me this? It's so weird. The it's reason why really humans bizarre. go to the negative mind space is be- and give like the what if and spiral yeah. is because of the fact that we're trying, it gives us some sort of feeling of control. Mm-hmm. If we can like prepare ourselves and put ourselves in the situation of like how awful that would be and how we would handle it. Yeah. It gives our brains the idea that we have control, which doesn't, that's not correct at all you don't have more control over the situation because you know more about the horrible things that could happen but like generally speaking that's kind of why humans are like doom google and you know go down spiral because it gives us a sense of like oh i understand this i can have control yeah no that's true that makes a lot of sense like it kind of like giving yourself anxiety makes you feel like you're prepared yeah or something i guess that's so true yeah. So my advice for if you're feeling that and feeling fearful yeah. is to completely go the opposite way. Surround yourself with supportive, positive information. There are tons of amazing books and podcasts out there. Like you can find podcasts that are just mm-hmm. birth stories and you can search through, you know, the titles will even say like what type of birth it is, you know, whether you are planning a VBAC or an unmedicated or like a home birth or you're you're preparing for a birth in hospital with an epidural, but you want it to be 
you know, mm-hmm. calm or whatever it is, you know, you can find these encouraging stories. And so I usually really recommend my clients try to do that, like find a positive mind space for themselves or mindset. I loved watching um, a birth story on TLC. Mm-hmm. I watched yes. like old seasons, like I really old. I remember you and Josh saying that. We binged you, like, you like seasons binging. and seasons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But that really helped. And it was yeah. everyone's story was so different. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, it can just help normalize the process for mm-hmm. you. Um, mm-hmm. Setting boundaries with people in your life who like to share the scary things or who are worried about the way you're planning your birth or whatever. Um, to be able to just say, hey, like, I love you. I know you have good intentions, but you are making me scared and I don't want to feel that way. You know, yeah, setting that sure. boundary. Um, but yeah, if it's coming from you within yourself, I think arming yourself with information and positive mindset is really beneficial. And so, you know, taking classes, there are tons of birthing classes out there. Um, you know, you find one that feels right for you and finding one that's going to, like, I think so much fear comes from a lack of information. Yeah. And like you're saying, like having no idea how things are going to go. So instead, you know, take an in-depth class. So many people want to do just like the quick hospital class, which I get it's like so easy. But if you take, if you are feeling really afraid, taking like a more in-depth class where you're going to learn more about the stages of labor, what you might experience in them. And you can almost kind of come up with your own little plans. Like, okay, well, if this does go this way that, you know, we're not planning on it going that way, but if it does, then I kind of have an idea of what can happen. And Mm -hmm. um, I usually really recommend talking to your providers too. And just saying out loud, like what's your biggest fear like what are you what's the story you've heard or whatever it is like what's sitting in your head get it out and ask your provider to talk you through how they would handle that situation and then you know most often you're going to leave feeling so much better like okay like it's going to be okay even in the worst case scenario that's sitting in my in my brain quick follow-up question when you're when the person who's giving birth is at the hospital or at home, wherever, mm-hmm. birthing center, wherever they are, and they're in the moment, they're having contractions, they're pushing, whatever, and they're like freaking out. Mm-hmm. What are some of the go-to things that you usually le- recommend that they do right away to help? Is it like breathing yeah. techniques or I guess it just depends on, you know, who the person is and what they're kind of comfortable with. But yeah, it definitely depends on the person and the situation. Like if we're in earlier labor and that's happening, the way I approach it is different or than if we're in pushing, right? Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, some of my kind of go-to techniques are, yeah, breathing. Like, okay, let's find your breath in through your nose, out through your mouth, slow it down. So many people when they get panicky yeah. like yeah yeah exactly and so it's yeah. like okay find your breath let's slow it down um oftentimes i'm just doing it and then they can instinctually mimic me yeah um which is really helpful and just like touch like gentle touch yeah. can be so grounding when it you're is. feeling these intense sensations just having this like firm gentle touch yeah. can feel really like calming and grounding sure um massage like especially like we hold so much tension oh, yeah. in labor like in your jaw and up here so like gentle massage um using aromatherapy like lavender just things to help you kind of calm and bring it down take a sip of water um you know so like in earlier labor we're doing things like that maybe some ha- you know if it's because they're experiencing pain trying some hands-on maneuvers that can sure. help to relieve that um whereas you know when we get further along in labor and we're pushing someone starts really freaking out sometimes we do uh we call it like the take charge routine which is i you know i might be like janelle look in my eyes like look in my eyes you can do this yeah you know like i know this is hard i know this is intense you can do this like we're going to get through this and just like bringing you back to like this is the reality Mm -hmm. we have to move forward through this there's no like never on cancel (laughs) exactly (laughs) i feel like everyone hits that point too in birth where you're like i can't do this this is like I can't, I want out of this. Yeah. You literally can't. Like if you, I remember feeling in my second birth, like if I could separate myself from my body right now, I would. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and you can't. And then you just, yeah. yeah. I mean, you get through it and then that's the most empowering thing yes. is like. The strength. Ah, yeah. And, you know, so some people say, you know, like more when you spiritualize birth, like you are, you are dying to yourself as like the maiden, right? Like Mm -hmm. Mm pre-mother and you're becoming someone new. And that's why that part is like so hard. And you feel like, you know, people will be like, I feel like I'm going to die or whatever. And some people really spiritualize like, Mm. well, you kind of are dying to like who you were before and you're becoming a new person. She wasn't scared before. Now she is. (laughs) Sorry. I mean it in a beautiful way. I mean it in a beautiful way. Like beautiful way. (laughs) It's beautiful. It is. I feel like I've been rebirthed as like a way better human. Yeah. 
And again, our culture doesn't really create space for you processing like that. Like mm-hmm. how you mentioned your first few weeks just being like, whoa, this is my Your life morning now, whatever. Who you were before. Yes. Yeah. That's you really exactly do. Right. And that's a normal process everyone mm-hmm. goes through, but nobody talks about yeah. it. That's so, and so, so true. just knowing that that's normal, you're going to experience that and you will feel like yourself again. You'll be different. Yeah. But you'll find that again. Um, mm-hmm. I think so many people need to hear that and they don't. Yeah, It's so true that we don't talk about that enough because going into it, I, I I mean, once I had been through it myself, I was like, okay, now when anyone else I know goes through this, I'm going to be able to support them so much better because mm. I actually know. Like before it was like, how are you? How's the baby? Right. Oh, okay. And now yeah. I dig further. I'm like, yeah. but how are like, you? Yeah. How like, are you actually? Are you like, it's not easy yeah. really checking in and like offering that extra layer of support and not just like getting them a cute onesie and being like, right. peace. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, you just can't understand it until you're going through it. It's like the most beautiful time of your life and the hardest all at once. And that's, yeah. it's really, it's intense. Absolutely. It's so intense. So it really is. yeah, you deserve oh. support through it. Yeah. That's no, right. that's for sure. Like, don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. Like, yeah. a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to burden someone. Or they feel um, guilty to say that I'm not doing, doing well, well right now. Right. Like, oh, you should be so thankful. You just yeah. had a baby. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know. You're not happy. Do you not love right. your kid? Like, right. like that's the yeah. weird thing, too. I've oh. never understood is like, you can love your kid more than anything in the world and also it be the hardest thing you've ever been through. Right. And yeah. also your hormones, like, a lot of it, I'm over here acting like I know what I'm talking about, but a lot <laughs> of it is like chemical. Yeah. Well, yeah changes in your body that you not have easy. no control over like not yeah. at all yeah it's really Ooh. wild until you're going through it like i just did not get it like, yeah i was like i'll be i'll be strong yeah it's you it's control. intense like hormones are no joke no joke i know everyone's always like oh it's just the hormones like excusing it and it's like no yeah. the hormones yeah, like no they're, they're literally, literally they're the hormones you yeah. <laughs> okay someone says do you have many clients who have attempted or had a successful mm-hmm. v back um, how do you feel about OBs and doctors trying to make pregnant women feel like once a cesarean, always a ser- cesarean? I had a VBAC in 2020 and it was the most amazing thing I've ever done. I wish more women knew that it was more possible to have one. And first, can you explain what a yeah. VBAC yes, is? Yes, I was just going to say. So for those who don't know, VBAC stands for vaginal birth after cesarean. So this means you had a C-section um, with a previous baby and you're attempting to have a vaginal birth mm-hmm. next time around. So first of all, I love this question. Um, congrats on your VBAC, whoever asked it. That's awesome. Okay, so I have I have supported several clients through VBAC, which is always really special and fun. Um, it feels especially empowering because, like this listener said, a lot of OBGYNs and doctors aren't supportive of VBAC. Um, so, you know, a couple decades ago, the norm was if you've had a cesarean, all the rest of your birth. That's so interesting because I was Mm -hmm. a C-section. Like my mom has a C-section, but then my brother who came after me was vaginal. Right. And so like quite a while ago, it was very normal. And then all of a sudden, you know, like our parents' generation, that's really cool. Actually, of your mom. That's like pretty rare. Yeah. Like our parents' generation was a lot more like once a cesarean, always a cesarean. It's just, it's not really evidence-based practice. And so ACOG, that's like the standardized, you know, um, a cog. ACOG, it's the oh. American cog. Cog. American cog. <laughs> <laughs> Based on the standards for OBGYN practice, essentially, in gotcha. America. And so, you know, they even say that if you're having a healthy pregnancy, you're a healthy mom. Um, to have to attempt a vaginal birth after cesarean is mm. safer. So, you know, the thought was there's a really, really small risk of uterine rupture when mm. you try to have a vaginal birth after cesarean because where your uterus was cut what? open for a baby oh, to come out okay. for cesarean, the thought is, you know, like where that's sewn up, if it's if the scar didn't heal properly or whatever, Got that it, it could cause issues okay. in vaginal birth. I was so it's kind of why they that. started that practice. Mm. Um, however, you know, evidence shows that risk is is really, really, really low and even compares to the risk of normal, not normal, like weird, not weird. Sorry, I'm all over no, the place good. right now. You're good. Um, it compares to other risks that come up in even like your first vaginal birth. Right. And so it's kind of like, well, why are we, you know, cesareans themselves, and especially a repeat cesarean, has so many risks associated with it. 
And it's like, at what point was someone like, well, this really tiny risk of this outweighs all of these other risks sure. of having a repeat cesarean. So, and all that to say, of course, there's a time and a place. And I always encourage my clients who are considering, you know, what they should do. Should I have a repeat cesarean or should I have a VBAC? Um, again, like your gut, your instinct is so important. What feels good and right to you is valid. And not everyone wants to try for a VBAC. Maybe they had a traumatic birth experience that ended in cesarean the first time and they don't want to go through that again. Valid, you know, like do what's best for you. However, um, a lot of counties and hospitals are and providers even are not offering and extending that option to their clients at all okay. for a vaginal birth after wow. cesarean. And again, it's just that's not what's recommended. So would that be something that early on in your pregnancy, you would want to make sure to ask, you know, whatever hospital you plan to get birth at and like wherever you yeah. are, make sure that if you're if that's something that you want, that that's something that they would allow to happen? Absolutely. And I always recommend my, my clients who are considering VBAC um. I always check in extra like, hey, like, how's your provider? And they kind of tell me the basic thing. And I'm like, no, really, like not every provider is very comfortable with VBAC. Mm -hmm. And it maybe, you know, it's not necessarily their fault. Maybe they just haven't seen it quite enough. And even mm -hmm. though it is maybe the recommendation, they're just not comfortable themselves with it. And so finding providers who are genuinely supportive and comfortable with it and see it play out and. You know, some providers will be like, yeah, I'm supportive of VBAC. But at the end of the day, if there's like even the tiniest little bit like hint of something different happening, they're like, OK, you know, well, we're supportive of VBAC until you're 40 weeks. And then it's sure. like, no, we can't do this anymore. Yeah. So finding providers who are very comfortable with it um, is really helpful. And, you know, there's tons of resources out there like VBAC Facts is one. Um, the VBAC link is another that just help you learn about, you know, all the options that you mm -hmm. have. And so, yeah, I love supporting VBAC. Actually, the client I'm waiting on to go into labor next is a VBAC. So, oh, cool. yeah. Interesting. Yes, will be fun. Do you have to overcome any squeamishness surrounding the birth experience? I feel like this is great, especially, you know, in the earlier years when yeah. you were doing this. Were you ever like, <laughs> or has it always just been amazing? <laughs> it's actually weird because I would be curious how other doulas would answer this question. For me personally, I haven't really but I've never been someone who's been like weirded out by blood or sure. anything like that. Um, and I also nannied forever. So even like poop, pee, yeah, like, yeah. Well, like vomit, like I was so used to it. Yeah. Um, none of that really weirded me out. I would say the only time I really experienced some squeamishness was when I was pregnant with my son a couple of years ago and I was doula -ing while pregnant. Uh, um, and I'm sure like you can remember oh, Kendall, like yeah. certain smells and certain things just feel so much more intense. Oh, for sure. Um, and so definitely, you know, I had a couple times oh. that, you know, it was never like, oh, this is gross yeah. or weird. It was just like, oh, that smell is, is bothering me more than it normally does. Like, and oh, like, oh, to throw up never back. bothered me, but now I might throw up on you as well. <laughs> and actually it was during COVID. And so I had to oh. always wear a mask and oh. it was like kind of helpful because it kind yeah. of like blocked the sense. Right, right. Yeah. Um, or, you know, if I was like making a face or something, yeah. but, and I always You're like you gagging know, under like, your mask. Like, You're doing amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, again, I'm never ever weirded out by like the birthing person. I'm never like, oh, that's gross. Yeah. Um, but just, Pregnancy hormones, man. Ooh. Yeah. So mm -hmm. makes sense. Okay. That would be really hard. This person asks, have you helped black mothers in your years mm. being a doula? I want to have kids soon, but with the high mortality rate of mothers giving birth, it has me a bit worried for my future. I want to also have a doula by my side, and I'm not sure what's the best way to find the right one who will advocate for me when necessary. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love this question. This is such an important question. Um, yeah, I think there's several ways to kind of answer this question. I I have supported Black mothers through my career as a doula. Um, I love it. It feels like very sacred. I really just honor that type of work that I get to do. Um, it is really important and valuable to me as a doula to recognize, you know, what's going on in our country and even around the world. And, um, you know, for those who are unaware, there is a higher maternal mortality rate for black women and for all women of color. Um, but black women are three to five times more likely to die in that childbirth is horrific. and that's pregnancy. crazy numbers. Is that in Amer that's in it's America? It's crazy numbers, yes. And the wow. reason it's three to five is it's kind of different based on area. Like New York is yeah. like one of the worst areas. Interesting. Um, and so, you know, when these numbers were really coming to light, 
however long ago some studies were done like what's going on here yeah and you know they determined there's nothing genetic it's nothing like that it is systemic racism in our medical community so like lack of care proper lack care, of care lack of listening to their yes. patients advocating for yeah. taking them seriously and so something you know there used to be this thought process like during the times where slavery existed mm-hmm. um that black people and like enslaved people didn't feel pain as much as we do yep and so even stereotype that still people believe exactly that is still reciprocated in medical journals and classes um you know like it's been coming to light more and more over the last few years like some medical students will be like well this was in my literature or like you know i learned about this from this person and god it's just absolutely wild and and you know even our um some of the techniques that are used in a cesarean were like learned about um while performing them on enslaved black women like without medication oh my god crazy and just just horrific and Mm -hmm. so um all that to say i think it's really important that you arm yourself with information um i'm sorry that you have to even have that fear um something that's really important to me and the group of doulas that I work with and actually Mike, the co-owner of Lucina Rising Birth Work with me. She is black. Her name is Hiru. She's absolutely amazing. She's given birth twice. Um, and something she's very passionate about and I've become passionate about alongside her is like black birthing joy because this mm-hmm. has become such a big topic in our culture, um, which good, like it's so good that we're bringing awareness to this issue but at the same time, now it's making so many of these people, so many black women and people feel scared yeah. of giving birth and rightfully so. But and so trying to reclaim that like black birthing joy, like it doesn't have to be all fear based. Um, yeah. So I would definitely recommend like, you know, finding some resources. A few resources that we recommend are like Black Birth Workers Rock is one where you can get online and you can find like a black doula near you. Um you know, local here in Colorado, we have a group called Mama Bird. They're amazing. They're a group of all black doulas that serve the community in tons of ways beyond doula work. Um, there's one called Black Moms Blog. They're always sharing resources and information. And then Black the Black Mamas Matter Alliance is another good one. And so, you know, finding these resources, surrounding yourself with supportive information from people who have been through it, who are going through it, going through the system, learning techniques from these resources, and also being able to find peace and joy through that community, I think is really beneficial. Um, Definitely hiring a doula will be really helpful because that is part of what we do is advocate for you in that space. And um, a lot of what's happening is, you know, because we were saying like, there's this like deep seated belief that Black people are not experiencing pain the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there are tons of videos that have been leaked, like nurses just fully or and OBs, like just neglecting a black woman who's saying like, I am, no, this pain is different. And they're going like, well, you just had a baby, you're in pain. And then it turns out they're having like a severe hemorrhage and, you know, and we've covered some stories similar to that on the show before. It's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. And so, um, Hiring someone who's going to be in that space and say like, no, no, like my client is saying this and you need to take a look at what's happening and just making sure your voice is being heard is really important. So um, usually when I have black clients come to me, some of them will say, you know, like I'm looking for a black doula and I love to recommend, you know, several black doulas that I know um, to help you feel that community in that space and someone who really understands what you're going through, I think is important. Um, but yeah, some questions you could ask a doula to make sure they are going to advocate for you, which I think is, was part of the question is exactly that. Like, because there are some doula trainings that will teach doulas, you're not allowed to advocate. That's not within your scope, blah, blah, blah. It's this whole gray area in doula work. Um, whereas in these cases, it's incredibly important that your doula feels able to speak up on your behalf. And so while you are interviewing doulas, asking them, you know, can you give me some examples of times that you've maybe had to speak up for your client or whatever it may be. And just really finding someone who's willing to do that for you. Um, And again, just surrounding yourself with information and then at the same time, positive stories as well so that you're not just feeling so gloom and doom about everything I think is important. Yeah, that's wonderfully said. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I know you just talked about advocating for yourself. More broad of a question, advice on advocating for yourself in general. Yeah, I love this question. Um, Again, you know, we've mentioned a couple of times today, like our culture is not great at respecting pregnancy and birth and the birth process um, or being supportive in it. And, you know, the U.S. has kind of just put this conveyor belt way of going through yeah. birth and it's not right for everyone. Um, and the numbers show it to be true, you know, like outside of black maternal mortality rate, the U.S maternal mortality rate overall is the highest of any developed nation that's shocking it's awful that is horrific why do, why do you think that is who i mean that's a really <laughs> hot topic. broad question but <laughs> no it's a big hot topic um i mean i think if we really want to get into it you know there's tons of interventions that come into play like medical interventions within the birth process right yeah. and all of them have a time and a place um you know medical indications for being induced, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, there's a time and a place for all these things, but they all do carry risks. And, you know, for a while, then it just became so easy to be like, well, if we just do things this way, we get to have control over it and it's easy. And so a lot of these interventions are being overused when sure. they're unnecessary um, and they carry risks. And so they lead to other interventions and it's just kind of turned into this whole big mess where... um. Yeah, it, it's a mess. And it is. yeah. so that's why it's so important to take time to learn about your options, take time to learn what feels important to you and what doesn't. Again, like with clients, sometimes I have clients who are like, I don't care really sure. about this or that, you know, or they have one specific thing they really care about. And it's like, all right, let's learn about that. Um, but I think there so often it's we don't know what we don't know. Right. And so getting to come and be like, hey, like these are going to be your options. Let's talk through them. I think a lot of times people also assume, which is not their fault of like, well, I'm not going to question this medical mm -hmm. professional. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they obviously they know, know the best. Yeah. They know everything. And therefore, I'm just going to take their word for it, even if it doesn't feel right or makes me nervous or I right. would want to do something else. Well, Obviously, you know, they know better than me, so I'm just going to kind of go with it and do what they say. Oh, absolutely. And that's huge. And and you have to realize that for all these providers, you know, OBs and midwives alike, like this is another day on the job. Yeah. And for you, this is a life altering experience. But for them, you know, especially in a hospital setting, they're going out into a hallway with 10 other people that yeah. they're taking care of. Right. And so if you are the one cesarean that like maybe wasn't necessary, like it's not yeah. much to them. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, it's just I mean, it's such a mess. And, you know, a big part. It's a whole systemic issue. Like, you yeah. know, if you want to get into healthcare, you know, oh, like, yeah, that's some OBs are like well aware of the issues, but they can't do anything to fix it because they're so overwhelmed yeah. by the system. And so it's just it's such a mess. So all that to say, it is so important to learn how to advocate for yourself. Um, first of all, learn your options, get evidence based information through your pregnancy um, figure out what feels good and important to you, um, what decisions you would like to make if different things do come up through your pregnancy and birth. Um, and then, you know, a big tip on advocating for yourself is to not wait until you're in the moment and it's happening. Mm. Communicate with your providers ahead of time at your prenatal appointments, you know, in those last few weeks, especially bring information to them and say like, hey, you know, I was reading about this on this you know, like evidence, evidence based birth is my favorite resource for all things. You can go on their website and find resources on just almost every topic for birth. Um, and so, you know, bringing that to your provider and saying, this is what I would like to happen. This is what's important to me. Mm. Um, and, you know, communicating ahead of time is key. And then if and when it does come up in the birth space saying, hey, I know that we talked about this. Remember, this is important to me. I really want this or I prefer this. Um, and then, you know, like there's a whole spectrum of how it can be. Some providers are really like, cool, great. If some providers get a little more pushy when you're trying to communicate, then you can say, I understand what you're recommending. Yeah. Um, I'm saying no, I'm refusing this. And, you know, for whatever reason you may have, and you have every right to do that. Some hospitals might even have you sign a waiver saying, you know, yeah. like that you're refusing the recommended care. Um, and again, everyone has different points of view on this, but every provider is different. Every hospital is different. You know, again, some of them are recommending things simply because 
they're scared of getting into, you know, yeah. it's the fear of litigation. Sure. And so if you're saying like, I understand the risks and I'm, and I'm wanting to make this choice yeah. still, um, yeah. then that's all you can do. And, and you have a right to do that. At the end of the day, you have a right to birth how you want. And the most important thing is, you know, if you understand the benefits and the risks of whatever choice you're making, someone asked about free birth, which is where you birth outside of the hospital like with no medical provider present mm. um so without a, like a midwife even without even a midwife wow. it's called free birth and obviously it's a very hot topic totally um have you ever participated in one i have not and every doula is different every doula has a different philosophy there um i personally probably wouldn't okay. i would be a little bit afraid of lawsuits myself um mm especially in the state of Colorado, like if you are the most professional person in the room oh, and really? something goes wrong, liable. Like you can be held liable, even though oh, I'm not medically trained. Sure, interesting. Which is crazy. Okay. Um, anyways. But you do have the right to do. Well, and that's like, what I'm saying is like birth inherently isn't this medical emergency. And so you get to make the choices that feel good for you and your family. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And for some people that is like, yeah, I just, you know, I trust my provider and I want to go along with everything they say. And some people don't feel as trusting and you you have a right to make whatever decisions that you want for your, you and your family and i think the most important thing is understanding the benefits and the risks and having good evidence-based information mm. to help you make informed decisions so, yeah. yeah 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 absolutely have you ever had an experience with a mother that was so bad it made you second guess doing your job as a doula Ooh. um i'm trying to think I don't think I've ever had an experience with a mother or a family that was so bad that it made me feel that way. Um, I have been to several births that have made me feel that way, but not because of the way the mother was or the Aww. family was. Um, you know, watching, you know, we've been talking about the system failing us as women, like watching that play out in front of your eyes in the birth space is awful. And again, like, as doulas, we're just one piece of the puzzle getting yeah. to try to be there to help, but we don't get to control everything. Um, and so sometimes really watching the system fail someone right before your eyes is horrifying. And I've been to several births where I just get in my car afterwards and cry my oh, eyes out. Oh my God, I bet. I go home and I get in the shower and just cry my oh. eyes out. And it's just, it's so hard. It's so emotional. Um, it's gotta be so taxing. So no mom has ever made no me mom feel has that a, No way. mom has ever been like. The system has yeah. made me feel that way. Absolutely. No like momzilla. Momzilla. I was about oh to say like bridezilla. Yeah. Um, I have had several partners make me feel that way. Mm. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Like unsupportive partners or like weird, like, you know, kind of judging oh, whatever yeah. it is. Uh, that can be tough. I remember we asked you that before um, we went did. into it. Like, did you, has any of your clients brought their Xbox to the <laughs> hospital? <room? laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. Uh. Not Xbox, but yes. <laughs> the Switch. <laughs> really? Oh, my God. All right. Yeah. Carol, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you had someone ask to have the husband mm -hmm. stitch? Thoughts on the husband stitch? What is I the husband even, stitch? I have never heard of that. Really? Good. No. Good. Yeah. The husband <laughs> stitch? Does he get a stitch? <laughs> he should. Right? <laughs> <laughs> stitch his mouth is. shut. I'm guessing I know what this is, though. The husband stitch, the concept of the husband stitch is that when, if and when you tear, when you're pushing your baby out and you need to get stitches, that the provider throws an extra stitch in there to make things tighter. Tighten it up for, for the, the husband. husband. Oh, my God. That, it's all you about know the husband. I shouldn't be shocked. That's that makes literally total sense. a thing. Is okay. And the is doctor's that, like, I can hook you up, man. And they will joke. I about was gonna it. ask, do people do this, or is this more just like a funny thing that people joke about? So this has been a practice. Absolutely. What? Not anymore. I have never seen it play out. Again, Colorado's a little more progressive. Yeah. I'm part yeah. of some Facebook doula groups. Um, you know, so there's doulas all around the nation that will share some weird shit that they see. Totally. That I'm like, we do not see that in Denver, but <laughs> oh it's horrifying. Anyways, yes, yeah, so the husband stitch, yeah, that's like a thing that used to happen. I've never seen it play out, but I have seen OBs joke about it and or husbands joke about it. Oh my and God. And it's just literally like genital mutilation. You know, it's just awful that that's even a thing. Um, wow, I shouldn't be surprised. That's actually a real thing. Can you get one if you want? Like, what if the 
person giving birth wants one. I mean, I suppose you could ask for it. Interesting. It would make things really uncomfortable for you. Um, you know, you the goal is for things to heal back to kind of how they were. Right. Yeah. Um, and for your tissues to go back and heal the way that they were. And right. so it's also kind of a joke because, like, so the external skin is a little tighter yeah, at the opening. Yeah, I was going to say, but what that's are they? not like okay. internally. It's like all the way tight. You know what I mean? Right, like, yeah. right, right, right. Not that it would be right either way, but even so, it yeah. doesn't really make sense. sense. Like, <laughs> okay. Oh. So no, I've never seen that. I have seen Obi's joke about it though, and that wow, I give, wow, that's I give really upsetting. That is major fire eyes when <laughs> I bet. I'm like, do not. Oh my god. That's um, crazy. what is the longest time you've seen someone push? Ooh, good question. Actually, that just happened. I would say this week, this past week. Oh wow! I was at a birth with a woman who pushed. Probably almost eight hours total. What? Yeah. Oh my god. Eight she, hours. She was a powerhouse warrior pushing woman for eight hours. So how do you even like do that? Misunderstanding when it comes to pushing, people think you know when you're pushing that long, you're pushing the whole time. Yeah. And you'll remember, Kendall, like yeah. you're pushing with contractions, so you right. usually get a little bit of break. You know, a couple minutes in between. Not enough. That's not to say. <laughs> yeah, it's not enough. It's, it's not short. enough. <laughs> It's very yeah. intense. It's very mm-hmm. intense. Um, she actually experienced where she felt the urge, the urge to push. And so she did for a couple of hours. Baby didn't come. And her body kind of gave her a break, which we mm-hmm. do see this often in unmedicated birth where your body will kind of chill out a little bit. I was going to say she was it was unmedicated. She was unmedicated that whole time. Wow. Oh, Isn't my crazy? God. She's amazing. Oh, she's women are so <laughs> she's strong. my hero. Oh, um, yeah. And so she kind of her body gave her a little bit of break. And so she rested a little and then she started feeling the urge again. And we're all like, OK, this will be it quick. Um, and then oh. she pushed for like five over five more hours. <gasps> and and then her baby was born vaginally, which wow. is just it's so hard, you know, being in that setting and wondering with a different care team, it would have been approached differently. Yeah, there are a lot that. of providers who would have cut her off after a couple yep. hours and taken her back to the OR for a cesarean. Mm-hmm. Um, her provider was very supportive and we did see the baby was making progress that whole time and so yeah. it was like it's working it's yeah. just taking and actually a baby was born with what's called a nuchal hand which is when their hand comes out with their head and oh, so wow. you can imagine even though it's just a tiny little baby hand oh. it's just extra diameter that you're having to push out and so oh. when we saw that we're like okay this explains so it like the elbow and everything. isn't that oh crazy my gosh i didn't some know are that like was possible. this some come like this hers was fully oh. like hey <laughs> Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, so she's amazing. Our... And this was this was oh, at home? Oh <laughs> no, she was in the hospital. <laughs> oh, okay. She was wow. in the hospital. And they still let her go the full Yeah. Hours. If you're pushing yeah. for a like if you're pushing and pushing, and even if it is like quote unquote working and like there's mm. no reason yeah. to stop. If yeah. the mom's like, okay, fuck this, I'm yeah. done, can they request a C section? And they're like they're supposed to honor that? Well, there are several interventions that can come into play, right? Like they could introduce Pitocin at that point if it's not being used yet and try to get your contractions a little stronger or a little closer together so that, Mm. you know, when you're pushing with a contraction and baby's coming down, oftentimes when the contraction ends, baby kind of goes back up. And this is the normal process for pushing and it takes time. It's like pooping. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It is. <laughs> it is. Literally, that's what happens sometimes <laughs> to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, getting those contractions closer together so that they are not, <clears throat> baby doesn't have as much time to like sneak back up. That's one technique. You know, there's several other interventions that can be used like um, forceps or vacuum assisted birth. Oh, and yeah. these are tools they can use to help guide baby's head. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, those are things I've definitely had. Mom, you know, I had another mom earlier this year who pushed for about four hours, also unblocked, like no epidural. Oh, oh boy. It's just it's mind blowing to watch. It's just the most like. Is this scary? Powerful ever? thing. You ever, like, I, not shit. really for me, but it's emotional. It's yeah. emotional watching mm-hmm. someone I've gotten to know and really yeah, care for. Sure. I bet. Just go through this intense experience i mean for anyone right yeah. but um so she you know at one point she was like what can you do to help me yeah <laughs> she at that point Aww. and they were like let's try vacuum let's try vacuum assisted birth like baby's low enough let's try it and so yeah there are certainly interventions that you can ask for um and i do want to emphasize this is very rare the most likely scenario is you know for a first time mom usually takes an hour or two to push that's very mm-hmm. normal 
um, up to four hours can be normal. Um, and then these are, you know, very extreme cases. Sure. And, you know, some people push for five minutes and especially well, yeah. second, third time around. Slips that baby's right out. coming out a lot quicker usually. Um, I remember thinking that too, like when they were like, it's time to push. I'm like, okay, like 20 minutes. Yeah. Here we go. Not yeah. going to be that bad. Two hours later. Two hours. Yeah. Yeah. It's I feel like you don't realize how long it can actually take. Yeah. And it gets that discouraging for a lot of people. I can see them start to question like, you know, you guys are saying I'm doing a good job and, you know, you're yeah. saying I'm making progress, but am I really? I can't see yeah. anything. Right. You have to know that it's so normal. It's just, it's such a normal process. Baby has to fully descend through the rest of the pelvis and yeah. your vaginal canal. And it just, it takes time. Um, and that's also, again, movement in the pelvis can be so beneficial because sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, it, like you said, Kendall, like pushing on your yeah. side was great for a while. Yeah. And then we had to switch it, it up. We switched it up. And then yeah. it was like, all right, you can. You know, you're pushing a little more efficiently this way. Let's let's do this. Let's stick with this. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Someone says my biggest fear is a home birth gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a home birth that needed to transition to the hospital? What was that like? Yeah, this is this is so valid. So I think home birth is kind of on the rise. Um, you know, people are hearing about it more, seeing about it more, and everyone has lots of emotions and opinions about it. Of course. Um. Yeah. I mean, home birth is a very valid option for healthy pregnancy, healthy um, birthing person. And yeah, but uh, oftentimes people in their lives have a lot of emotions about of it and opinions about it. And so that can be tricky. Um, home birth gone wrong. You know, the idea is that you have a very skilled midwife with you. And what people don't understand about midwives is they are trained to handle situations that they need to and situations yeah. that arise um and they are also experts in spotting what a lot of them call like yellow flags like mm. before it's a red okay. flag oh, okay yeah. it's like you Things know and keep they're an eye on. experts at that and then so you know a midwife approaches birth by saying like mm, the majority of the time birth is a normal life event and you can do it you know yeah. right and every once in a while we have these situations where we need interventions mm. and so midwives are you know, a, a good midwife, I should say, is skilled at spotting those things, you know, long before it actually becomes an issue and saying like, hey, I think it might be time to consider transferring to the hospital. Um, I've actually not been to a home birth that has transferred to the hospital yet, but oh, really? I have been to several birth center births that transferred mm. to the hospital, mm. which is a, a similar process. Um, and again, that process, you know, it can feel intense, obviously, like changing the scenario right. and identifying like, hey, we need we need some extra eyes. We need some extra care here can feel intense and emotional. Um, but I have never been in a situation that was so mortifying or oh, scary bet. or awful. Um, actually, before I ever attended a home birth, I, I myself even was a little like wary of them. And then yeah. it was watching midwives handle situations gave you, like, that the kind of scared mm. me. Um, and watching midwives handle them so skillfully in home, whether in home or in the birth center or transferring, yeah, that gave me the confidence. I actually birthed my second baby at home. Um, you did? Yeah. I had it to go at home. Oh, wow. I For some reason, I thought those pictures were in the hospital. Yeah. Oh, I was and just I about mean, to ask about that. Yeah. It's not for everyone. It's yeah. not for everyone. And that's, you know, that's another misconception is everyone thinks like, oh, if you had a home birth or if you're planning a home birth that you must think that's like how everyone should do it. And right. it's like, yeah. no, like that was right for me. It felt right for me. I wasn't yeah. sure it would be right for me up until the very end. I was like, I might go to the hospital if I want, like, yeah. you know, and then it ended up, it was good. It was right for me, but it's not right for everyone. And that's, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, home birth gone wrong. There's you know, so much, there like, are these horror around, stories yeah. out there, but the idea, you know, what would be ideal is that you interview midwives and find one who, not only feels like a good fit for you, but you make sure is skilled enough to handle these situations yeah. that might come up. And, you know, I was dueling through my pregnancy with Indigo and planning my home birth. And as a doula, I saw some tough situations in births that scared me. And so being able to co go to my midwives and talk to them and say like, hey, I saw this play out in the hospital the other day. How would you handle this if it came up and we're at home? And them talking me step by step, sure. like methodically how they're like trained to handle this or it gave me so much peace. And there, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand how trained midwives really yeah. are. Yeah. 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 What's the heaviest baby that you've delivered? <gasps> Ooh, a heaviest baby that I have seen 
born. Or that, yeah, I keep seeing born. Um, personally, I think nine pounds, six ounces was okay. the biggest one. That's pretty big. So a pretty good sized baby, but not shocking. Do you know what the largest baby to be born ever was? Because I've recently heard of it on TikTok, <gasps> which I don't Did know if you? it's Did you? I, may I not have be definitely accurate. seen several. You I want know. you to guess before you look it up. Oh, yeah, let's guess. Sydney, will you find it? Yeah, okay. Sydney, will look it up. I'm pretty sure I know what it is, like so I won't guess. 14 pounds. Okay, what's your guess? It's higher. In, unless this was wrong, this was on TikTok. So, Whoa. <laughs> but it's someone that How I much would trust information from, hopefully. Mm. 18 pounds? Close. 25 pounds. Say in the US? I uh, I think it was in the world. Okay, yeah. Then twenty five pounds. It. No, twenty pounds. Twenty two pounds. Yeah. Twenty two. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. That was what I heard on TikTok. Twenty two oh, pounds. That's how much oh. indigo weighs. Like my <laughs> fifteen month old. Yeah. Twenty. Whoa. Can you imagine? Whoa. Can wow. You that would be imagine. really painful. <laughs> yeah. That's to really carry, painful. To birth, to oh. recover from. I have seen Ooh. like a lot, you know, a lot of videos make the rounds in the birth world of like 11 pound babies, 12 pound yeah. babies, like yeah. even being born at home, like to, to try to normalize, like babies are squished, like big, big babies happen, <laughs> you know, like it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. But 22 pounds. I know, is... right? Like, I'm like, oh, Damn. that's horrible. I mean, that's Ooh. literally two Charlies. <sighs> wow. Yeah. Isn't that wow. Crazy. That's wild. I know. I want to know more information about that birth. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the details are. I know, were. like, tell us more. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay, have you, how many births, and you don't have to answer this, but mm -hmm. how often do people poop? Oh, okay. Um, I would say, mm, like, in my own experience, probably about 60% of the time. A little mm, over half. Yeah. A little over half. It's honestly yeah. less than I thought. I thought, like, pretty much everyone poops it's so normal i would i actually don't know what the statistic is i probably should but i would i would guess the statistic is a little higher mm -hmm. um than what i've seen but yeah and i do want to like quell some fears okay. if you're scared of pooping i was in terrified birth, i feel like so many people are first of all it's so normal your whole birth team thinks absolutely nothing of it um, but second of all, if you're worried about like your partner or something, seeing yeah. so many providers and nurses are really skilled, like you will never know. They will, your partner will never know. Quick wipes. Yep. Like it happens and they're <laughs> just like, you know, you've got, you've usually got some pads under you, like absorbing like amniotic yeah. fluid and stuff. And so they just kind of use it and like wipe it away. They're not like, oh, we got a shitter. <laughs> <laughs> shitter <laughs> broke 240. <laughs> they put on your door, shitter. <laughs> you get the poop emoji on your door. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would be amazing. Oh, I, I thought, I mean, God. I see how it would happen. It feels mm. like for, I thought for sure well, I am going to. Don't they say it, to like, push yeah. like you're pushing out a poo exactly right or, and when so you're there, actually that's what you're have doing like a rectal nerve that um you feel when you need to poop yeah and that that baby like your baby that baby <laughs> your baby when they're descending through your pelvis hits that same nerve they and want so that's you to. why it feels that way <laughs> yeah <laughs> interesting yeah, that, yeah. I, I was like for sure i did oh yeah but, mm. how many women tear that, tearing, well, not statistically, but in yeah, your experience, yeah. in what my would you experience, say? tearing is very common. I would say probably like seventy to eighty percent mm -hmm. have at least like a minimal tear, like a first yeah. degree tear. Um, it, you know, and someone even asked about tearing too, like how to prevent it. And there are, you know, there's like stretches you can do, like warm compresses while you're pushing um, on your perineum can help to prevent. Um, a lot of OBs get like pretty aggressive. <laughs> My hand motions, like <laughs> <laughs> literally with yeah. your vagina. Remember, she did that to me. That yeah. was that was like one of the most painful parts. Oh. Is like her putting her hands yeah. in there. And some people find oh. it helpful. Um, there there's it. some evidence that suggests that that can contribute to tearing, which makes sense. That would make sense. Yeah, um, because it's like also you know like in causing there. swelling and you know yeah. so avoiding things like that can help uh, prevent tearing, but. It, at the end of the day, a lot of it does come down to genetics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you tear at a home birth, do you do they stitch you? Mm -hmm. then? Okay. Yeah, you'll get um, lidocaine. They'll do like shots of lidocaine, like a local anesthetic, gotcha. mm. um, which is also not fun. So that yeah. is, you yeah. know, that's kind of like a benefit of an epidural is, you know, yeah. you know afterwards they can do stitch place stitch stitches without you know those shots. But I mean, when you are you've just been through birth. 
having those shots yeah you don't really notice i have a lot of moms that are like bring it on you know like any sort of like numbing sounds great yeah um yeah so you know at at a home birth or out of hospital birth if you have what's called a fourth degree tear that's the most intense one so like first degree is pretty gentle um up to a fourth degree tear then you would have to transfer to the hospital for stitches um it's just a little more a little more required there yeah um, but that's that's very rare. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Oh, so Janelle, so fun. have you had any? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Has this my, scared you more? <laughs> um, <laughs> my goal today was like, I'm going to normalize birth. No, and I now think I've you have. You even more scared. No, actually you haven't because I, uh, not that I knew all this, but I have like heard about your experience mm-hmm. and I actually worked at OBGYN office and I was a doctor or anything, but I was just kind of like around it. So most of it, I, I felt like I was already aware of, but yeah. Mm-hmm. It sounds intense, but I already know, at least I think I know that if I were to get pregnant, like I want all the drugs you can give me, baby. I don't want So a lot of them like, oh, well, I wouldn't have, I'm not worried about like necessarily feeling the pain of like tearing or something because I, at least what I can think, I'm like, stick it in me. Like, give me all the drugs you can. (laughs) Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. But I don't know. Yeah. It's unbelievably empowering, I would assume, Mm -hmm. you know, like, and. It's interesting because like you were saying, it's so taboo, especially in America. You don't talk about it, but it is the most natural thing in the world is giving yeah. birth. And yet mm-hmm. it's still so like, eh, yeah. like I don't want to hear about it. And like, yeah, a lot of women, at least m- more so recently, I think it's changed. But for a long time, people were like, don't talk about the bad parts of pregnancy and like right. how everyone was just supposed to act like, oh, I'm so beautiful and yeah. glowing. And I love being pregnant. And that's great mm-hmm. for some people. But yeah. for other people, it's like, not fun it sounds like and it's hard and there's some people hate being pregnant and that's okay too and you know normalizing that and normalizing talking about the great things but also the really shitty parts of it yeah yeah i think that's so important yeah normalizing all the conversations like the good the bad all of it um yeah so people just feel prepared or not even prepared but like so that you can feel not so alone totally when you're going through because I think a lot of people that have like a harder pregnancy, they feel so isolated right? or a harder birth experience, you know, and it's like, you're not alone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, But yeah, our culture sucks at just talking about it. Yeah. And people feel weird on both sides of it. Like people Mm -hmm. don't want to share their hard, intense stories because they don't want to scare people. And then people don't want to share their good stories because they don't want to like make someone who had a bad experience Mm, feel feel bad. Right. Yeah. It's like no one wants to share their stories. And I'm like, no, what needs to happen is this like communal idea of you know you had your experience i had my experience they were different and we're supporting each other and that's it you know have you ever been a doula for a family member like like one of your fish i guess i should I, know this off the top of i guess my even if you like going, don't if no. you're not feeling comfortable answering that oh, that's no, no, fine no, but like is fine. that a normal thing to do or is yeah. it kind of like, like you want someone on un- yeah exactly yeah like, i have not been a I've been a doula for friends um not for any family members all my like cousins and sisters had all their babies before I was a doula Mm. um but is that a thing that happens definitely people will like have their sister there or whoever (laughs) to be their doula I think you know when I first became a doula I was like that would be so fun like if my sister had another baby I'd love to be there and support her yeah um you know, being in it more now and even doing for friends, sometimes it gets hard because you want to say things. You know, if it was a stranger client that I would like say certain things that with a friend, I'm like, oh, I don't want them to take that the wrong way. Right. Or, yeah. like, feel like yeah. I'm, I was or feel like I'm like being weird or like, right. you know. Yeah. So I think I think it can be tricky. And maybe sure. that's just my personality. Like no, some other doulas though. are probably great about it. But yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, that would be kind of hard. Yeah. Oh, I can't think of anything. I think we've been going for a while. Yeah, this is going to be a really long one. So yeah, Oof. maybe we'll wrap it up. Okay. Okay. Well, Carly, it has been awesome having you on today. It's been such an interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think it'll be very valuable to so many people out there, whether you are interested in having children yourself, you're already going through it, you've gone through it already, um, you're helping someone else go through it. I mean, all this information and having this normalized conversation, I think, is really important and I hope valuable to many of you out there mm-hmm. and to all the moms out there and moms to be. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah. And you are amazing. You are strong. <laughs> and we love you. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Again, oh. so great to have you on, Carly. Come back anytime. Yeah. We Thank would you love so to have much you. for so having me. It's been so fun. Thank yes, and of course, yes. all of the ways that you can reach Carly will be down below. Yep. Um, please check her out. She's wonderful. Follow her on Instagram. And that's going to be it for this week. Yeah. Thanks for joining one. us. Yeah, this was a long one if you're still here. Yeah, thanks yep. for listening. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and we'll be back and Monday we'll be back or Mo- Thursday. Huh? With- uh, next oh Thursday. yes with Marlena. with Marlena we are Stout. so excited to have her it's gonna yes. be a really great episode yeah. so that's me it for this week we'll see you on the next sesh but until, until then, then keep, keep it, it fresh, fresh.